Good evening, everyone, on this rainy Wednesday evening. And at this point, I will close just a second. Okay, we had a kind of somebody muted, uh, unmuted. So we welcome you all for our first monsoon evening in the Himalayas uh, from the Kulu Valley, and it gives me immense pleasure in reintroducing Peter after Sunday on Wednesday again, thanks to our technical glitch, which has, I hope, and crossing my fingers, been resolved. Um, at this point, I'd ask all of you to please mute your mics. And uh, after I make the announcement, you can put your videos off. Uh, Peter will stay online with his uh, video on because we wish to see him as he presents. So Peter Van Ham, he has worked for 30 years in the Himalayas. He has documented incredibly these monasteries, which were out of reach for most people. And he has dedicated uh, nearly half, not, not half, but a lot of his life uh, doing all this. Um, I met Peter in um, 2017, thanks to a dear friend of mine, Dr. Sonam Spalzin in Ladakh where we were on the footsteps of Rinching Zangpo, the first architect of the Buddhist monasteries in this region. And when I met Peter, I knew that we will be in touch. And in touch we were. He came to uh, University of California, gave a beautiful talk there, and I'm so happy he's back giving a talk on our forum today with the Himalayan Institute of Cultural and Heritage Studies with our Unlocked series. So Peter, over to you. Please tell us all about doc research and documentation in Gugge, in Ladakh, Alchi, Kinnor, and these wonderful places that you have uh, brought to the world. Uh, you've showcased not only uh, the wonders of the Himalayas here in the northern part, but in the northeast as well. So over to you, and please uh, stop your videos and mute your mics. And let's look forward to a wonderful evening with Peter. Thank you very much, Sonali, for this great introduction, very, very friendly introduction and um, very um, praising introduction. I don't know if it's really that much. Um, I hope you will see from my presentation today that it's pure fascination that uh, made me travel to the Himalayas and from then on find niches or um, points of interest that to my very much to my surpri surprise weren't researched on before when I started out. And the reason for that was mainly that, um, at least for us foreigners, but I think also for the Indian population, for the main population, the non-local population of the border regions between India and Tibet, those regions were closed for about 50 up to 60 years after Indian independence uh, because of the problem with the Chinese and intruding into Tibet and then you know going on and on and on further 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 to the western part of Tibet and you know we all know about the path that they left behind the path of destruction and although I'm not a, a friend of military activities, of course, I must say I'm really, really happy that the Indian Army was giving it a stop in their regions, regions that were not really defined by uh, political means, the, the uh, very renowned Shimla conference where Tibet, China and uh, British India were coming together to define the borderlines, they were not ratified by the, by the Chinese. So that up until now gives them the how they feel the permission to again and again, now even in Bhutan and other places of the Himalayan border regions to define their borders just the way that they think uh, uh, they want it and they think is correct. Or maybe it's just uh, a way of, you know, trying to take away uh, interest from the COVID situation internally, we never know. And uh, a friend of mine, Wu Young, was just mentioning that I mentioned in a Chinese uh, 
a paper on uh, my exhibition. I don't know how that came about and what the Chinese care about that, but you never know. Anybody who's starting to take up these things that I've been doing, as you can see here from the various books that I'm presenting to you in this photograph, are all uh, probably under surveillance, but I don't mind and I don't care because I think it's fantastic to um, highlight, to showcase this amazing culture which still exists in the border regions between India and Tibet um, because of the variety, because of the manifoldness of cultural assets which are still available or still experienceable there in these regions. And I started out in 1987 by traveling after I finished my music education in uh, the US and found out for myself that this lifestyle is not what I wanted to do for the rest of my life in popular music. So I had kind of a hiatus coming back to Germany where I live in Frankfurt and then, you know, trying to organ orient myself differently. And I always had the fascination for the Himalayas before. So I traveled there for the first time. And the first thing I got was, as I mentioned last time, before we all glitched with our um, program, um, I got high altitude sickness coming into the Himalayas. And uh, that made me realize I just wasn't prepared as well enough. And so I came back and I wanted to access just these border regions because I thought that in these long forbidden regions, there must have been something that was uh, still alive there, which was extinct in other places. So the, um, what I also already uh, discussed with you last time, which I'm going to do shorter now today, the uh, famous um, poem by Rudyard Kipling, uh, an author, British author, the author that fascinated me through his Jungle Book, but later also because of his wonderful novel, Kim, which plays in Shimla and plays exactly in these regions. Although these regions are not really mentioned in this novel, it becomes clear because he mentions the Hindustan Tibet road that goes via Kinar into the Spiti Valley and all that. And he has this wonderful um, no, uh, poem called The Explorer, where it starts out with something is hidden, or it doesn't start out like that, but the, the, the center of that poem is like that, something is hidden, go discover it. And um, that discovery, I thought, should have been or must have been in that part of the world. And indeed it was. And uh, um, when you start out on a journey like that, especially in a region where you don't know what to expect, it's best to keep your eyes open and to be open-minded and to be open and, and happy for everything that you see. And by the way, do, we, do you see these things that I'm presenting full screen? I just wanted to know because last time it was only it's not small full screen. screen. It's, not it's full screen. screen, yeah? Okay, so I go on. No, it's not full um, screen, Peter. Not full screen? Yeah, not full screen. Oh, good, you tell me. One second. Let me just check this. How is that? It's still, I, I can still see um, the bar. Uh, okay. It's a good thing you tell me because that would not be nice. Still not? No. Okay, well, I'll do that again. And uh, before I'll know if that's gonna work. When we tried it in the beginning, before the talk started, it, uh, uh, it was worked. working. I don't know why exactly. Let me 
just check. Repeated, I think it's pushed in now. Okay, now? Yeah. Well, you see the... the... Yeah. How's that? The bars are still up, yeah. Peter. Uh, yeah. In the full screen mode, we shouldn't be seeing the bars of uh, the, uh, the of your uh, laptop. And it was working before. Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. Like we can we can see the visuals, but they're just not full screen. I if it, if it Was matters, there? no. Still not. So uh, Kate Remember is saying, maybe you you should try clicking the little green button. I did. Wait a second. Okay. The little green circle in the left corner. That's already there. I don't get it bigger than that somehow. I don't know why. That's okay. I wonder why it worked the first time when we were doing the trial. It it was perfect. But it's okay. You carry on. We can at least we can see the visuals. Yeah. It's full screen that way and the presentation. I don't know. Whatever. Okay. Something is hidden. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, as you can see from this wonderful photograph I took flying up to Leh in, in, in February, March, um, there are thousands of valleys there and uh, most of them contain some ethnic group living there and trying to make a living there in these really, really difficult circumstances. And Due to the isolation, many of them or most of them have preserved some cultural trait and some speciality, which is from an anthropological or ethnographic point of view, is really worthwhile getting to know. So my, um, my region, of course, as you know, was between uh, Pakistan and Tibet up in the Western Himalayas and also then here on what we call the ear of India in the Northeast. And today, it will be on the Western Himalayas. So this is my first photograph that I took on my uh, terrible trip where I got uh, high altitude sickness. It's the first uh, image I ever took, I ever photograph I took of the Himalayas just Peter, when I reached can I, back. Can I, can I Sorry to interrupt, we can't see. Uh, the, something is hidden, yeah. really hidden, it's blank. It's blank and only something is hidden is seen. Ah, now we, now we can see. Thanks, Peter. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Still there? Yes, yes, we can see it now. Good. So that's the, <laughs> that's the first unhidden photograph I took of the Himalayas. The rest I didn't want to share with you. That's right. So the great thing was for me, after years of researching on the Western Himalayas, I came to know that there was already one person uh, who was very creative, who did almost the same thing as a painting. And that painting was uh, painted by Nicholas Rurik in the 1910-1920s, and it shows almost exactly the same view of the Chenab River flowing from Kinar um, towards the Spiti region. And on the right, you would see uh, the access towards the Rotang Pass, where you come from the Kulu Valley. So actually I started out with Sonali Hazar Institute now, flying into Kulu, going up to Manali. At that time, 1992, it was not that overcrowded as it is now. And then accessing via the Rotang Pass, I wanted to get into Sanskar and up to Ladakh, but high altitude sickness struck me. So I I had to go home. But when I returned, I saw that other images were already taken before. And in fact, the, I present a lot of these images, you know, contemporary ones which, with historic ones in my book, Indian Tibet, Tibetan India, which is published in India by Yogi Books. And uh, there you see the same thing. Uh, another painting by Nicholas Rurik of Kardang village, which is, which is a famous monastery uh, opposite of Kilong the main town of Laul. 
I tried to access the Spiti region in 1987 when I was there for the first time, but it was completely denied access because no foreigners were allowed up until 92, 93. And then was the first time that I was there. And I started that journey uh, from Shimla with my friend Mohit Sharma of Great Himalayan Travels, which only became my friend while being there because when I came there, there was no uh, tourism to the interiors taking place. There was all honeymoon tourism. And when, I, when we approached the Department of Tourism, the people told us that, don't you want to um, rent a boat and then make a nice rowing uh, thing on, on a lake somewhere here. Why do you want to go up to Kinar and Spiti? There's nothing there. So I said, well, my travel companion is male. I am male. We're not intending to marry uh, pretty soon. We just want to go there. But there is no, there was no Jeeps available during that time. There were only three Jeeps. One was broken, one was on tour, and the third one was belonging to the chief minister. So there's no way we could get it. So it took us a week in the bazaars to find out who is organizing what? And then Mohit approached us in a bookstore and said, sir, you want to go to the to Pinar, to the Western Himalayas? And I said, yes, please. And then we came to his booth and then uh, he organized within days uh, a Jeep down from Solan, I think, from the, from the, from the mainland, which was uh, not a good car, but the only thing we could get. And it took us all the way for six weeks up until Leh, and so it was just amazing to do that tour. Shimla, of course, has changed, as you all know, but you can still find that old flair that it had before. And uh, it's still a fascinating place with a lot, a lot of history. And as I said before, the journey ended at Leh. And um, the only thing I could do for you know getting into um, understanding the region or trying to find out a little bit about the region was accessing these old travel accounts or cultural accounts. And one of these accounts was written by a German, August Hermann Frank, an archeologist from uh, Eastern Germany, who was a, a Moravian missionary, but mainly he was an ethnologist, a linguist, an archeologist, and he was very interested in the region where he was working, which was actually Ladakh, the Moravians had a mission in uh, Kilong and they had one in Pu in Kinar. So when he was uh, appointed by the um, Archaeological Survey of India to do the first uh, um, survey of the cultural aspects of the Western Himalayas, that book still serves as a, as a, as a source for this region, written in 1909 and then published in 1914 and with photographs taken by Babu Pindi Lal, who was a uh, photographer for the archaeological survey in Calcutta, and he went all the way up. And they traveled for, I think, three months from Shimla via Kinar up until Kashmir. And basically, those are the regions that I followed uh, before I discovered also, of course, you know, Rinchen Zangpo as a, as a person who um, built monasteries in that region and who was culturally one of the main uh, people focusing uh, w w on which this, this area focuses. It was the first photo I took in 93. A lot of change already, but um, not as much change as it has become in the last 10 years with almost each of the house, you know, having an internet uh, access or internet cafe. It has become a very tourist place. Naturally, it's a place of immense beauty and uh, let's hope that Ladakh can cope with all this tourism there. Sometimes I have the feeling it might be a bit too much, but this is the way of the world, I guess. Um, the more I traveled, the more, of course, I got interested also in the history of the region and who else had been doing what in order to understand uh, what had been researched before, because as a foreigner with limited access to um, regions which had been closed for so long, it naturally um, had to be researched also from the desk at home. So I found the, those great images of Samuel Bourne uh, from 1856, the first British 
who tired from photographing British ladies in the photo studio in uh, Shimla, went to the interiors, went on the Hindustan Tibet road uh, via Rampur up to uh, Chini and Kalpa, up to Pu, up to the Spiti Valley, up to Sarahan, up to the Sangla Valley and made these amazing photographs. Um, they are all in the book, Indian Tibet, Tibet and India, as comparisons as I'm doing here. And this is the photograph without knowing that Bourne was taking this. I was doing in uh, 1998 when I was on the road, or 96, I'm sorry, or 95, I don't, I don't remember. When I was on the road with Dr. Osi Handa, the great uh, Indian archeologist and art historian from Shimla who paved the way internally, so to say, for my research there, because him being a part of the archeological survey of India, he, of course, was able to access uh, special permits um, so that I could do work inside the monasteries with, which were under archaeological, archaeological survey. And he joined me once for a tour into the interiors on the trail of Rinchen Zangpo, as we call it. And from that time onward, from 1994, after giving me all the photographs that he had ever taken in these monasteries for my first travel account, which I published in 94, um, we, he invited me to come back and, and go with him on tour. And, and, and it was just an amazing time because he's such a knowledgeable person, such a warm hearted friend that he's become over the years. And I was very happy that over the years we could, you know, exchange things. I could give him my photographs. I could give him my views. He gave me his. So it's been a friendship for the last 30 years for which I'm really, really, truly grateful. And as you can see, and back to this photograph, the only thing that has changed on this suicide point near Rogi, which is close to the Kinar Kailash at Chini, is that the handrail is gone. Where, where the people were traveling up the Hindustan Tibet road with the caravans, and then, you know, on that very, very steep passage, trying to fix their, um, their walk and by holding a handrail, that is gone now. Um, but the rest, I think, is still there. I think one part of this rock is, of course, um, crashed away. And uh, naturally, the traveling was different. That we did. There was not much of the caravans anymore. Um, but the Jeep, as I said before, was as adventurous, I think. And it was more like the tires were more like those swimming tires that little children are using in swimming pools because it had no profile whatsoever. And, uh, but the, the interesting thing was the car was fine. It was a copy of an old, uh, it's a Mahindra Jeep, old Willys Overland copy. The problem was the driver who became so homesick during those six weeks of travel that he was every day on the brink of leaving and leaving us at home alone with this vehicle or leaving us alone in the middle of nowhere because at that time there were no maps. There was nothing that we could rely on. We, the great thing was it was only one road going from Shimla up to Leh. So you could not really, uh, you know, get lost on the, in the region. But uh, it was a true adventure, true psychological thing, trying to keep the driver uh, with us um, so that we could achieve our goals. Going to these various places was an adventure too. And um, Babu Pindilal photographed these rope bridges uh, crossing the Spiti River here, for example. We didn't see those, but in Sanskar, where I was in uh, 2008, those were still there, uh, made from birch um, branches and coiled together. And still being more durable than the, than the metal bridges that were just next to it, washed away and to, due to um, earthquakes being um, cut down. But the the bridges that we saw and that we experienced in, in that first trip, by the way, the man with the tropical helmet down on the left is Franke. And he, this is the place where he tried to cross um, the, the Sutledge River going up to, to Poo, where he um, heard that there was a, a, a monastery of interest um, erected by Rinchen Zangpo in the 11th century. And he had to carry all his um, provisions and all his belongings on these so-called julas, those uh, uh, swinging um, bridges with a, with a swing where you sit and one person can go. 
And those were still there and those in fact are still there and in some places are the access points towards the higher pastures or this one was on the way to uh, the Baspa Valley up to Karcha, um, um, yeah, Karcha, I think, and then up to Chitkul. And that fine gentleman invited me also to join him. You can see his wife uh, at the um, end of the bridge um, pulling the handle, so helping them to get across. And luckily, we just came from the Sangla Valley, so we didn't have to use this bridge to access there. So we went all the way on the left side or the right side, the proper right side of the Sutlej Valley, a uh, Sutlej River up north. Um, it starts, um, that's why I say keep an open eye. Everything is a fascination in that region, I think. This is like the climax of Kinori architecture. It has often been associated, which of course there's a transition with the Shimla Hills, which it still is, and the architecture is still very similar, at least the traditional architecture, um, the Kinori style and the Shimla Hills style with those um, shindle uh, roofs and the deodar, cedar um, beams, alternating with uh, natural stone that is uh, broken there in the region. And it is an amazing, amazing, unique architecture which is just existing in that part of the world. A little bit is in the Kulu Valley, but I think that the core of this architecture, this very special architecture is down in the Kinar Valley and the Shimla Hills. And um, if that Chinese newspaper is talking about me doing an exhibition in Hamburg, maybe they want to, they're watching us now. And <laughs> so I tell them, um, I would love to do a survey on, on that traditional architecture while it's still there, because the problem in Kinar is, I think, although I love that place, the people have become very um, fast wealthy because of the apple cultivation that they're doing. And uh, the trouble is that naturally they are tearing down those, those houses were also not only the Bhima Kali temple in Sarhan, but most of the, the vernacular architecture, the, the, the village architecture was like that. And naturally after hundreds of years living in these places, they want modern buildings. So the, the main villages or most of the villages are torn down. I was really, really shocked when I came there in 2000 and um, I think it was 11 or so when I was able to photograph Tabo Monastery once again, that in most of the villages, the traditional architecture is almost gone. So um, luckily in the sacred architecture and the temple architecture is still preserved, but that's very, very few, unfortunately, because of course the whole village um, scenery is changing dramatically. Although I must admit, I can understand why people are doing that because it must be not that uh, favorable to live on top of the cattle and, and you know, these very traditional houses. But Sarhan has not, much, has not changed much. It is still an amazing, beautiful place. Sometimes changes also for the better in regard of tradition because that right tower that you see, um, has been rebuilt. I'll put the photograph, the old one back again. You can see the right tower here is a very um, less interesting structure. Um, the other one here now to the right is much more elaborate, much more carving has taken place. So sometimes trouble also uh, stimulate creativity and, and the people have done a great second uh, temple, which is probably even better than the than the left one there, uh, although new, but the carving is still, still excellent. And what I liked about Kinar, which is still the case also in the Kulu Valley, is that the tradition of the old religion that has been, you know, coming together with Hinduism is also still very strong. They have the Rata system where the Devtas are, as Moras are put together on on those um, ratas and then they take them out of the temple and the shaman or the priests get together. Out of them uh, and tell uh, prophecies for the future for harvest or for the fate of the village and all this. Those, those things are still 
very much alive in, in Kinar and in the Kulu Valley and the whole region there. And that's why we could, you know, t take the photograph like that. And, and that is actually, I think, from, from Kalpa or from, from Sarahan, I don't remember, where these amazing and excellent um, moras are still manufactured. A great thing to get into and to find out the, the background for, for this, um, this cultural trait. Um, on the more drastic side, I think uh, another amazing and unique uh, religious um, tradition is still alive in the Spiti Valley, in fact, in the Pin Valley, the only place besides um, central Tibet and Bhutan where this is still practiced is the uh, Buchan Fobadochok ritual, a ritual of breaking the stone where the Buchan Lamas, Nyingmapa Lamas, um, perform um, sadhu-like practices by piercing themselves through the cheeks with uh, sticks and showing the um, devta that has brought uh, illness to the place, to the valley, that they are much stronger than it is. And uh, when you see the, the comparison, it almost feels like those are the sons of the ones you saw before, taken in the, the 50s by um, a person who traveled in Spiti Valley, a, a government official who made a small book. Uh, um, and when I saw it in 98, it almost feels like the same, same uh, family performing these rituals. And they have the sword dance where in the end, before they break the stone on the chest of a person, of a lama that, you know, takes all the negative input onto him and then they crash the stone and the whole spirits that have been bad to the, a bad influence to the valley, they leave the place. Then they pierce themselves with, uh, with the sabers and that is still performed the same way uh, as we can see. And from an ethnographic, ethnological, anthropological point of view, the region is full. I mean, um, I would have loved to become an anthropologist, but it was just not on my uh, agenda. I was taking the path of, you know, getting a daytime job and doing these things, um, not to say on the side, I would say it's, it's like a more than the semi-professional um, thing that I'm doing here with 14 books that I've already written on that region and the northeast of India. And the interest to me is very, very strong. And that's why I picked up uh, teaching as a profession because um, it serves uh, paying the bills. It's a great job with the children, but it leaves you enough time. It's, in fact, right now we have vacation, summer vacation, six weeks uh, that I cannot travel right now because of COVID, but uh, that I used for traveling and then getting deeply involved in these matters and these subjects and then writing books about it. So this, this for me worked out because then I had the money and had the means to do the travels just like that and not having to write um, you know, applications for grants or something like that. And I preferred just going, seeing, researching and doing things and not spending so much time on other paperwork. This is a, uh, a painting that, uh, a drawing that Franke made, ha had himself made in 1910 in Ladakh when he was witnessing a marriage ceremony. And uh, on the right side, if your screen allows, you can see the uh, Nyopas, which are the, the golden boys, the golden men with the golden hats that come and take the bride to the groom and the lamas, uh, are performing the rituals and all the belongings are put onto the marriage uh, rope. And when I went to Sanskar and I made a film on that also, it was still the same thing. So, I mean, if I travel in Germany, nothing is like in 1910. But in these regions, you could call it because of poverty, because of inaccessibility. Naturally, that is the reason. But the great thing is that people also stick just like that to their traditions. And because Sanskaris, although it's a very remote region, there are many people who are, are fine and, 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 and having quite a good life and they still stick at least to my, what I found about, about the, the region sociologically. 
Um, but they're still performing these rituals there for a marriage. And it was an amazing thing to see that everything was still um, like the families coming together, asking for the bride, the whole bribing for the bride, um, you know, how much do they offer for the bride, all this, these rituals taking still place. And, and of course, then the, the nyopas that uh, perform these uh, dough uh, rituals where they, where they make dough figures, and then every figure means something for the couple, and then they extend their best wishes to them. So it took like three or four days. Um, and they were all drunk and <laughs> had a great time, full of chung, and, but it was an amazing and wonderful uh, experience. And uh, I made a film out of that with all those pre-Buddhist rituals that took place there. It was just amazing to see. Um, Architecture-wise, as I pointed out already with Sarahan, it's, it's amazing. Um, also the Tibetan architecture. This is Dunkar, the old um, capital of the Spiti Valley. Spiti Valley meaning the middle valley between Tibet and India. And when I came there, Dunkar was pretty much like uh, Franke Babu Pindilal's photograph. And especially that view that Bourne took, that main view of Dunkar was exactly the same, except for those two Jeeps that uh, um, we were able to travel with in that 1993 um, uh, journey that we took. Um, sometimes it's not as favorable in regard of architecture. This is the photograph uh, Babu Pindilal took in 1909 of Key Monastery, which is still the biggest monastery in Spiti Valley. But after that, there was an earthquake, I think somewhere in the 70s, and the whole thing collapsed but was rebuilt and this is how I saw it in from 93 to 98 onward now it's completely changed it's dramatically changed because of I think it's great that it's changed dramatically because the impact that those regions are getting from tourism also from the Tibetan refugees from the activities of his holiness the Dalai Lama um, using these traditional Tibetan regions, culturally Tibetan regions, as a backdraft for his own uh, people and for his own survival of his culture because of the terrible things taking place in China. I think it's fantastic that more funds get into the renovation and into the building up of these places. Unfortunately, sometimes they don't care much about the traditional way of you know, building up these places because concrete is used. Um, and the old traditions are not heated anymore, like this guest house that you see on the left side of the monastery, I think now is even higher than the main temples. And that before used to be a sacrilege against the traditions that, of course, the deity is not supposed to reside below the guest house. So, but those are the changes that take place uh, in the region and everywhere in the world. Um, Spiti Valley used to be a place with the highest rate of monks, monkhood in the whole Tibetan world. That is not because the people were so religious there, but because there were so few people in Spiti Valley. And every 10th person in Spiti Valley, as I found out, was in monkhood or uh, joined a nunnery. The reason for that being a sociological region a reason that uh, the, the ownership of land was so few and so little that the people were giving their second born son uh, to a monastery in order to avoid the splitting up of the personal um, ownership of land. And so that system evolved from there, the due necessity of keeping ownership together and uh, not being able to feed so many or to support so many people by livelihood themselves. And uh, um, Monkhut is still strong, very strong in Spiti Valley. And one of the most amazing things I saw was, you know, experiencing the Monk community up in Dunkar, that very, very remote place in 3,900 meters, where there's nothing, nothing else but the community of monks. And I, always admired the, the strength that the people were putting forward to keeping 
that lifestyle because you know the op uh, opening up of the region of course meant a change and a lot of people were leaving the monasteries i remember in tabu monastery um i came in 93 and then 98 when i came back i think two or three or four people had already left the monastery so the impact of course is there but i was amazed that so many people still stick to that old traditional lifestyle speaking of tabu um which we will get into a little bit more in detail a little further on. Um, Babu Pindilal was the first person who actually um, made uh, interior photographs. And it was just, you know, by um, surprise that when he came back to Calcutta and developed these films, some of the films were developed on the spot that they turned out because he was using this magnesium light, just blowing it up and then hoping that something was on film. And the great thing was that when I came there and had the permission to do my work there, um, nothing much had changed. I mean, this is pr practically the same photograph in color that um, uh, Pindilal was doing. Um, we'll get to that a little later. Um, the region is old. There's a lot of prehistoric um, evidence of people living in the region, but just because it's ibex and because it's um, archaic looking uh, um, figurative drawings doesn't mean that those um, petroglyphs are really that old we can go back to around seventh eighth century is what i heard or found out which are the oldest um, petroglyphs still in existence i'm very happy that uh, the local people are taking much care of these now I mean, they're trying to save um, them from being used in, in street and road construction and house construction. And there's a um, great person up in Ladakh, for example, Cholden Gasha, who is uh, um, running a Facebook page uh, on petroglyphs of the Himalayas. He was very helpful in, uh, in my last book also by giving me evidence of of rock carvings and rock drawings and all, and all that. So I'm very, very happy that local, uh, the locals of the regions are taking care of these things themselves. And, and there I found them very, very fascinating. And in fact, they were very helpful in, in um, getting a, a, a firm um, interpretation of inscriptions in Alchi Monastery, which I will show you a bit later. Um, Change is taking place. These are the Drogpa nomads which roam between Tibet and Ladakh on the, and the lake sides in the Pangong Lake and the Tsomori Lake and the Changtang Plateau. Um, in China itself, they are asked to settle down or they are forced to settle down. The few remaining um, still do the Pashmina trade for uh, Ladakh and Kashmir and still living a very, very hard life, but from an ethnographic uh, point of view, very, very interesting to experience and to travel with them uh, during the summer time, during the pastures and what they are doing. And um, ever since I traveled there, I tried to find or to access the Tsomoriri Lake and only in 98, I was able to actually find the path there. At that time, it was still not open for uh, foreigners to travel there. Now you know how many um, tourists are going to Tsomoriri and Pangong Lake uh, and most of them immediately from high altitude uh, and high altitude sick because it's 4,800 meters high. So um, it's very important to get acclimatized before you travel there. But it's an amazing sight. I mean, from a photographer's point of view, it's just essential colors, just blue brown and white from the glaciers uh, there. So wonderful place to be. Speaking of glaciers and white, naturally the Himalayas is one of the most endangered uh, regions in the world regarding climate change. And uh, I remember this is a photograph, Heinrich Harrer, the great famous explorer who wrote this book seven years in Tibet and met his holiness in the fifties after he escaped from a uh, prison camp, British prison camp in Dehradun, went all the way across Spiti uh, Valley into West Tibet, Guge, and then finally reached Lhasa. When he returned to uh, 
the Western Himalayas in the 70s, 1974, he went to Sanskar. He saw this glacier on the um, beginning of the Sanskar Valley like that. And when I saw it in 2008, the same view was like that. So it's terrible how uh, intense the climate change is taking place. One more time for you to see. This is the same. You can see the, the mountain ridge on the right. Um, take that as an orientation, which is right there without snow. And all of this has melted away. And it continues like that. And what that means is that we'll uh, experience a severe decrease because um, all the cultivation that takes place in this high altitude uh, um, desert zones can only take place because of glacier um, irrigation. So maybe the human beings as they are will find a way to irrigate from the, from the valley side, from the river side. I'm, Probably they are doing it already, but still the impact is very, very strong. So to put these things together, my interest was, was um, a global one. Um, in the Tibet, Tibet and India, uh, the cultural heritage of the Western Himalayas in Yogi books shows all of this as a comparative or, or a comprehensive research. Um, I was most fascinated, I must say, of course, by the monasteries and by the secludedness, by the um, art that they were preserving. And uh, this was for a long time one of my favorite photographs of an explorer. I have become a member of the Explorers Club in New York and of various societies that um, care for exploration and, and not, not that we want to take first steps into a region, that's not what it is about to be the first at a place, but to experience something which is extinct in other places. And this fulfilled, this was fulfilled to me when traveling in the Western Himalayas as well as the Northeast. And this photograph from the 1950s shows an Austrian mountaineer who came to uh, a monastery in Sanskar. And I loved it so much that in 2008, I did the for my, my girlfriend took the same photograph of myself and uh, that's also in the book and um, it's it was fulfilled it was in the end it was finally fulfilled that you know even that monastery I was able to access it all started in 1993 as I mentioned before but in detail when I accessed for the first time a monastery in a place called Nako Nako is um, on the, the, it's off the Hindustan Tibet road. It's on the way to Spiti. It's still a part of Kinar, but culturally it already belongs to Spiti. It's part of the Hangrang district up in, in Kinar. And culturally it's mostly Tibetan, one would say, Tibeto Buddhists, at least to say. The Buddhist impact from Tibet here is very, very strong. And it's just, a stone's throw from the Tibetan border. And Nako has this lake there where you can actually row a boat as they were suggesting to us in Shimla that we could, should do that. But more important is the monastery that it contains. And uh, I remember going into that place, very rundown place, um, very dark and having my torch and lighting up these, these uh, paintings there. And uh, I remember the companion that I was with, he was talking and talking with somebody that he met there. And I remember just becoming still and just marveling at the images because the images to me didn't seem Tibetan at all. They didn't seem to be what I had, you know, looked into books about Tibetan art. They seemed purely into me at the time. And naturally, they were Indian because they came from India. I'd, at that time, I didn't know that they were 11th century, one of the first Tibetan art even uh, developed at that time. But I found them just simply amazingly beautiful and amazingly delicate. I mean, just look at this, how the shading is done on the chest of the central deity. Look at the dhotis they are wearing, the finest, like uh, one hair, um, brush that they were using to make these miniature-like uh, paintings. 
<coughs> the gold um, that they're using for the Vajra circle around it. So I was immediately hooked by the quality and by the fineness of this art, which to me was very, very special. And uh, getting closer to it, this, these are images I was able to take because of the wonderful help of Dr. Osi Handa when Mohit Sharma and I went back to uh, the Western Himalayas for our book on Guge, the West Tibetan kingdom, uh, of which these areas like Kinar and Spiti were part of in the 11th century, when the uh, great um, second transmission of Buddhism in Tibet took place through people like Rinchen Zangpo. We will get to that in a minute. And um, this is like typical, like look at the, the, the hand, the, the mudra that the deity is holding, uh, has having, it's like typical Indian art that was transposed into Tibet, coming from India, from Kashmir at the time. And it's full of amazing miniature like uh, hundreds of paintings. And when I came home, I was um, amazed that an image like that was um, photographed by an eminent Tibetologist Giuseppe Tucci in the 1930s when he went to Spiti and Kinar. He photographed Narco the first time. I mean, I'm sorry, Franke photographed it, but Tucci did the first in-depth survey on it. He went on to uh, Toling in, in, in the Gugge Kingdom, in, which is now Tibet, and he came back um, from a place called Mangyang, and he had a photograph of, a, of a, an image there, which was exactly the same, like that, uh, um, draw, uh, that, that painting, that wall painting that was executed in Nako. So I immediately thought there must be some connection. And of course there was a connection. And the connection was this gentleman, Rinchen Zangpo, by the way, a tanka that I had made in Spiti Valley by a very devout um, Amchi, who lives in, uh, uh, in uh, Kyoto village, um, or Losa, Hansa village, I'm sorry, Hansa village, who Andaji introduced to me. Is everything okay, technically? Uh, all is well. Okay, fine. So this person, Rinchen Zangpo, is a, is a local um, West Tibetan, uh, boy who was, you know, when became a monk or became a scholar and was sent to India by um, the then ruling king in the 11th century. And he became uh, one of the greatest scholars of Tibet because he uh, achieved the title Lord Zava, which, which means the great translator. That's why these books are shown here. And he was the one who, um, you see that here, who traveled through these desolate regions uh, over years up into the Kashmir Valley and into the Magadha region, which is Eastern India. Those were at the time in the 11th century, 10th, 11th century, the main uh, Buddhist uh, centers in India still. And of course, Kashmir was much closer to Western Tibet. So they went all the way from, which is now Guge, via Kinar and Spiti Valley, via Ladakh into Kashmir, to get um, education from the masters there. Rinchen Zangpo and that's such a trip. He went there twice for seven years is what we find out in his hagiography. And he was supported by a king who became the great luster of wisdom is what his translation means, Yeshe'u, the king who took monastic vows himself um, and left the kingdom to his brother that way, very intelligent. He had all the means to do all this uh, monastic work and translating the scriptures. But the amazing thing is that because of his efforts, one could say Buddhism has survived because only two centuries later, it all started because of the uh, Islamic invasion in the north of India. The Buddhist shrines were all, most of them were all destroyed and the scriptures were burned. But Rinchen Zangpo had taken them into Tibet, translated them, of course, with the help of others, and there were other uh, that had been translated in the eighth century already. But he made a great, great contribution to the, to the canon, the Buddhist canon, the Kanjur and the Tanjur, the commentaries. 
So most of the Buddhist text, we don't know about the Chinese legacy because that's still quite untouched, but most of the Buddhist texts are only available in the Tibetan translation um, and can only be, uh, Sanskrit is, is missing, is gone, is destroyed, but it can only be re-translated uh, to find out uh, the original texts. So he became the great Lord Sava. By the way, I found out that this was already his fifth reincarnation when he became such an active person. And the present person, the present reincarnation is uh, Lord Chintulku, which probably some of you are familiar with, who comes from Kinar, who is uh, internized in Key Monastery. And he is supposed to be, I think, the 17th reincarnation. And I was very lucky to meet him while we were doing film work up in uh, Kinar and Spiti. I would have liked to show you some films, but as you know, I have stripped it down uh, data size wise, so it won't be possible to show a film here. And he made an interview and in one of my books, he wrote a foreword, which I was very grateful for. So if we look at this, um, so for you to understand why I focused on that region and uh, my last four books or five books were all on this region because it's an immense region. It's a region which now incorporates five different countries. Um, core being Toling in Guge, the capital of, uh, of the Guge kingdom. Korchak was a place that they um, established. Tabu was a place and Nyoma. So they established uh, four monasteries, Yeshe Ö, to get his translation work and his mission work on Buddhism done there. He was deprived by the throne of the throne of Lhasa and had to go into exile into Western Tibet and started his work from there. And so parts of Nepal, parts of Tibet, parts of India, parts of Kashmir, uh, Pakistan side were all part of Google. So naturally it's a huge expense and the mo most shrines that are preserved are now in India on the side of Spiti, Kinar, and uh, Ladakh. That's why I focused there. But for one of the books, I've already, I've also was able to incorporate the Tibetan side. So monkhood started back then. They had the Nyingma Palamas from the 8th century on when Patna Sambhava was bringing Buddhism to Tibet. But the real... Um, conversion of people into Buddhists, one could say started in the 11th century. It was not very organized then. The whole, all of the sects, they started to be coming up in the 12th century. Um, but it was the first missionary activities, you could say. And the idea or most of the, 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 the core um, concept that you can find in all the monasteries of that period and which is still prevalent, although Tibetan Buddhism has much developed after that, was the yoga tantra um, concepts, um, especially the texts that um, focus on uh, Vairochana, uh, the Vajradhatu Mandala, uh, and its associates, the Sarva Tathagata, Tatra Sangraha, and all these um, texts that were part of the yoga tantras. And those were transmitted onto the walls of those monasteries. Here you can see. Vairochana as a four-headed um, white god, as a four-headed uh, main central Buddha, um, from him developing the Buddhas of the cardinal directions, as we will see a bit later on. Oh, there we have it. This is a, the main Vajradhatu Mandala, um, Nampa Nangse in uh, Tibetan. And the idea that is um, described here in form of color was that the cosmic evolution took place from the white light um, and the white light split up into the first um, uh, colors, red, yellow, green, and blue. And um, then it transformed into more this, the, the light uh, symbolism, of course, meaning uh, certain characteristics, certain, um, uh, states uh, and it goes on to, into psychological aspects of the divine and then transforms even more becomes more dim and even then later physical
systems like the color chakra and these very, very diverse and, and big systems have developed, but mainly this is like the core uh, concept which is still um, worshipped and still performed today. And the great thing is that is what I found out after Dr. Handa was helping me so much with uh, accessing this uh, place uh, under the archaeological survey of India, uh, the Tabo Monastery in Spiti Valley, uh, also from the 11th century, confirmed um, to be established in 996 and then um, refinished in 1042. The great thing is that this concept has been transposed to the walls there. You find the uh, fourfold by Rochana as a fourfold, fourfolded figure and used to be in the center of the, of the uh, main temple there, the Tsuglakan. And you find the various aspects of his cosmic evolution placed onto the walls of that temple in various colors with various mudras that all mean a certain thing. And you could actually see uh, um, as a three-dimensional mandala, you see the cosmic evolution transposed onto the walls of this temple. So possibly in Google before there were many other shrines that had that, but now this is the only place in the world where you can see it as drastic as that. Um, we know that the Borobudur stupa in Java has the same concept, but there it's much more um, uh, abstract. You can only see stupas, bell-shaped stupas at the top ranges of that uh, building. Whereas here you can actually see those really like in a two-dimensional tanka painting, you can see the deities uh, on the walls there all being projected by that central Vairochana and you have certain layers of that mandala, which is what I found out later in my research. And if you don't want to get into all these cosmic speculations or philosophies, from an art historic point of view, these are amazing, one of the best preserved, or the best preserved clay sculptures that have a clear Kashmiri background. And uh, Rinchen Zangpo took these Kashmiri uh, artists up to Google to fill um, the monasteries that he was uh, building with the art that he experienced in Kashmir. So we have to imagine what wealth must have been in Kashmir uh, in Buddhist temples before it was all destroyed. Um, but he transposed also that, luckily, to the Western Tibet. And you can see um, those wonderful, amazing um, pieces of art still there. You can see the models that they were working with in Kashmir at the time. Uh, you can see the, the Greek background that was preserved in the Kashmiri art through the Gandharan um, history, uh, the Gandharan tradition from Sonali was mentioning when Alexander the Great came up to Afghanistan and uh, Pakistan region, which became Gandhara, which was Gandhara. Um, and this also then transformed into painting. Um, for me, some of, the, some of the most amazing Buddhist art um, depictions in the world, and going back to 1042, some of the oldest even. You can see Kashmiri uh, sculptures, brass sculptures, but transformed to wall paintings is probably with Nako, uh, Tabo, and then later we get to Alchi and some other places. This is probably the only places in the world where you can still see that. Uh, amazing to me, you find Sasanian, Sogdian influences that came from the Silk Road, which we'll later find out also in Alchi, which are very, very strong there. And then the meaning why they are there is a special meaning that was just um, established or just uh, um, explored within the last few years. You can see the Sasanian roundels, you could say, in the doti of that deity there. And again, you have that extra fineness, this Indian extra fineness in the mudras and the shadings. I mean, look at the hand. It's just that the palm of the hand where the, the muscles are, they even get a small amount of shading. That, that gives the, the uh, painting such delicateness and they look real. When you go there, the idea of, of, of this illusionary environment becomes alive 
through the fineness of the paintings. And there you can see why it was not only Indian artists that were working there, because Indian artists would have known that an elephant doesn't, is not possible to have his feet like that. Um, it was actually Kashmiri uh, Indian artists, some of them even came down from the Punjab, as we know, and from, from Rajasthan, um, and worked in Kashmir. Um, but they, they learned the, the, um, the uh, Tibetan, West Tibetan um, craft, craftsmen in the art. They, they transposed the art to them and helped them and were probably working in a joint venture together because it must have been, would have been probably unbearable to pay these artists for such a long time. It took years to um, decorate these interiors, of course. Um, an amazing find in that regard, probably many of you are familiar with the Indian side of these things, of the West Tibet, Tibetan Guga Kingdom in the 11th century. Those are accessible to you. The Tibetan part is not as accessible, not also, even not for, for me, um, but we could find out with the help through of various other scholars that worked in Tibet much more than I did, um, that there are paintings in, in that region, West Tibet, that are very, very similar to uh, paintings in Tabo. This is from the Nyakla Kang Karpo, which is in the Kartse Valley, actually the birthplace of ancient Zangpo. We must imagine this was not bound by, bounded by political borders, but it was all Tibet or West Tibet or the Kingdom of Guge. There were local fiefdoms, but they became a part of, of that region. So naturally they were traveling back and forth and artists were going up to Toling or even later up to Mustang in, in northern Nepal and painting the places there. So here you can see almost identical Buddhas as in the circumambulatory path in the Tsuglakang of Tabo. And you can find here another uh, section which is very, very interesting because it shows probably one of the few um, real um, depictions of portraits of uh, Rinchen Zangpo next to uh, a central Buddha which uh, bears similarities to um, ceiling paintings in Ajanta. The, the two Apsaras that come down onto him are almost exactly like a rosette painting in, in Ajanta in the seventh century, sixth century uh, cave. But there you can see on the left side, you can see a monk uh, doing a celebration, doing a ritual on a stupa. And that monk, because Nyakla Kankarpo is mentioned in Rinchen Zangpo's hagiography, probably he was invited to his hometown to um, hold a ceremony there. Maybe somebody had died because stupas have many times have been um, uh, cremation places or places where the remains of somebody had been buried into. And uh, we can see that because of all the, all the um, either bell-like artifacts next to the, um, maybe my thing is working here, next to the stupa. Maybe those are also the shape of the Mahabodhi temple that is not really clear. It looks very similar to that, possibly to show the Indian impact, but that is pure speculation. But what is more important is that the stupa, the bumpa of the stupa has an eye, it carries an eye on it. And that is very rare, we know these these from, from, from Nepal, uh, from the central Tibetan art and from the Nevari art that was transposed into central Tibet. But in Western Tibet, it is very, very rare. And later on, when I worked in, in Alchi with uh, Dr. Amy Heller, the Tibetologist from the USA and Switzerland, um, we came to know a few places in Ladakh that carry stupas or carry engravings with stupas that have eyes on their uh, bumpas. And the signific significance of that is that the, the family or the clan of families that was supporting uh, the king of West Tibet and Rin Zangpo in his activities came from West Tibet, um, came from Ladakh. And that's why, you know, that for you familiar reading Tibetan, you probably will see that this uh, sign next to the stupa there uh, says Dre. Dre means the clan that was supporting uh, Rinchen Zangpo in his activities. And uh, 
there was a big issue on whether Alci came to find out by translating the uh, wall inscriptions that actually it is at least you know built in the 11th century by a West Tibetan king. But that clan that was supporting Rinchen Zangpo, you can see from the eyes and the stupa, this is the sign for the Drill clan um, in West Tibet, stupas with eyes. So that was a great uh, significant find, archeologically, you could say. Um, only possible, of course, by someone who can read Tibetan and read the scriptures and all that. I mean, that was uh, amazing and fantastic to have Amy Heller, such a great scholar, um, being along in Alchi, otherwise it would have been a nice uh, uh, documentation, but the impact and the intensity came from her contribution, of course. Let me show you a few other things in West Tibet on the, on the Tibetan side in the Google Kingdom. These are um, caves of later Google kings, somewhere late uh, 11th, mid 12th century, um, when there was a big fight between the ruling elites and those left for a place called Dunkar. Dunkar became uh, the capital and it became a huge monastery, which is of course now destroyed, but the, the, the meditation places, the, the uh, seclusion places in the, in the caves, in the wall, in the, ca uh, in, in the stone walls, I'm sorry, those are still there. And um, a friend of mine is from Switzerland who came from West Tibet and went into exile. He frequently traveled back and forth and he's responsible for building these shelters there so that these caves are uh, secured. And when you enter these caves, it's just amazing what has been preserved. Like this is a, a meditation hall consisting of 10 mandalas, um, all focusing on Vairochana, the Vachodatu mandala and its various forms. And so, the monks had everything they needed, so to say, to reach enlightenment. They went to secludedness, they meditated on these mandalas, then it became dark, then they visualized it, and they tried to uh, come to terms with the various meanings of the deities, of the virtues and the negative aspects, and then trying to transcend them and become purer and purer, and finally to merge with the cosmic original light, the cosmic state of enlightenment. So that was the reason why these mandalas were painted into these initiation halls, you could say. And again, we see Indian craftsmanship, Indian artistry in these monasteries, in these paintings. Um, we see Central Asian forms of Avalokiteshvara uh, with various uh, meanings that are different from the way we know Avalokiteshvara now. We see an amazing... Um, uh, um, getting together of historic personages with uh, deities who are part of a mandala. We see a West Tibetan king and his spouse or his wife uh, becoming a part of a, of a um, mandalic arrangement on the, on the left side of the this, of this screen here. And for me, um, one, of the, one of the great archaeological finds I could do because of my friend Tsering Angchuk in Ladakh, who runs a travel agency, the Great Global Expedition, and who I contacted him when coming back to Ladakh in 2008 for my exhibition in the Tibet, Tibet and India, and going to Sanskar, going to Dahanu, and then also doing more research in the Indus Valley in Ladakh. Um, it was just amazing because we had a few days time before I had to leave. And then he told me, well, I asked him, do you know of any other places uh, which might be interesting for me to see? And I said, well, there are these caves here on the Indus Valley opposite of Spituk Monastery. And they're supposed to be really old. They're supposed to have some old, old paintings inside. And I said, let's go there. It would be wonderful to see them. And when we entered there, it became apparent that these are actually the oldest paintings, wall paintings still in existence, older, earlier than, by 50 years than Alci. And they were first described by David Snellgrove and Skorupski in uh, their book, The Cultural Heritage of Ladakh. But they could not find out or, or um, 
you know, get together time-wise, where they, what they meant, where, where to place them. Because at that time when they were traveling Ladakh, Spiti Valley and Kinar were not open. So when I entered there, I immediately thought, those look exactly like the paintings in Nako. And when I looked at those are very quite faded images now, which um, luckily I um, got some support um, and, and a great team of uh, conservers and uh, um, restorers uh, together with uh, Jigmit Namgyal, the king of Ladakh. He, had a, uh, he has a cultural, um, cultural uh, organization, the Namgyal Institute of Research uh, and, uh, on Ladakh. And uh, we together um, procured funds and were able to clean this place in order to find out uh, what the wall painting is all about. Again, it's Vajradhatu Mandala and associated mandalas. And there you see, this is like a subsidiary deity on the, on the outskirts of the mandala. And it has pretty similar, um, even as faded um, uh, paintings in Nako. Um, this one is an Amitabha, uh, which has similar uh, paintings also in Nako. But the most amazing uh, comparison is when you see that Buddha, uh, the Buddha dis depictions as they are in this cave opposite of Spituk, which by the way is called Trakung um, uh, Those have a, 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 an amazing Ushnisha, which is like the, the big, that, that uh, um, bulge that is on the head of the enlightened Buddha and it has small um, uh, triple um, uh, things sticking out there and those are exactly the same in Nako. In fact only in the 11th century <coughs> were these um, uh, Ushnishas painted like that. Um, we find in a manuscript from Pu um, an illuminated manuscript, they have these uh, also there. But apart from these few places, they are not known exactly the way they are here. This is from the Pooh manuscript, where you can see from the very strong Ushnisha some more uh, things growing out of that. Another find archaeologically was the, the monastery of Saspotse, which is on the north part uh, of. Uh, of uh, the Indus Valley. And uh, it was amazing uh, because I didn't experience or expect anything like that. Um, when you enter that, you could find uh, paintings just like, like Alchi. Um, so from late uh, 11th century. Unfortunately, now it's better. There was no roof on that temple there. Uh, I think now it has been roofed. Um, nobody had ever photographed it or documented it before. And it was like a, um, um, a treasure trove of Kashmiri uh, wooden figures that was just placed there. And naturally we tried to convince the people to do something in order to secure uh, this place because otherwise you would find these things on the art market sooner or later. Um, I think now it has been secured. There are locks on the door. Um, you can see from the moisture that these uh, wooden figures are actually really endangered, but I think um, it was a great find and uh, we measured it and we took, took a, um, photographs of the, the iconographic program there. And it's all pretty much 11th century or before that Kashmiri art that is Kashmiri West Tibetan art that is still preserved there. Another great uh, find was Charan Monastery, which again was only possible due to the, due to the amazing engagement of Mohit Sharma in, in uh, my friend, long 30 year old friend, 30 year long friend, not old friend, he's my age, um, who really tried to convince the people that we're doing good work and they're very, very strict on not allowing people to do anything there, but because of Chirgon Rinpoche, whom we contacted, and the local uh, monks, which were not there, it was, you know, finally in the end possible to work there. It, it's the last um, village in Kinar on the way to the Tibetan border. It's heavily militarized, a lot of a big army camp there, but it's a place which is actually confirmed to be a Rinchen Zangbrick's establishment from the 11th century. And you find in there 
the same idea. You find the uh, Buddhas of the direction that stem from Vairochana on separate spaces of the walls with their surrounding bodhisattvas, not in as good as a shape and good as quality as we find them in Tabo, of course, more of a um, folkloristic way, but there has been a lot of uh, redoings of these, of these um, figures because the place is still worshipped. And uh, um, again, different colors, different mudras mean a certain thing in, com in the connection with the mandala where they are in. And you find amazing wooden sculptures. The re main reason, by the way, why they, people are so apprehensive against um, any work being done there is, of course, theft. I mean, they experience a lot of theft taking place. And uh, um, I always feel ashamed that many of these things land in Western museums or land on the art market. And uh, naturally, this is unfortunately the case or can be the case if those things are not secured well enough if you start working on it. Nevertheless, I think it's important that these things are documented because many times fires take place, earthquakes take place. So for research sake, I think it's important to document them. These are wooden uh, figures that are absolutely unique, um, size-wise about 45, 50 centimeters each. So quite large and possibly were taken there from Kashmir up to the border of Western Tibet, which was no border at that time. Another find which is com connected to Franke was in uh, uh, 2011. We were the first foreigners to access there on the Changtang Plateau, even further towards the Tibetan border near um, uh, the Nyoma district um, after Tsomoriri or east of Tsomoriri um, at a place called Nyoma where there's only Chang Changpa nomads and uh, Tsering Angchuk uh, supplied permits for us. The first permits ever given to Western travelers after Franke to go there because the people, the, the, they welcome, welcomed us and said, yeah, the last person that was here was this missionary, as my grandfather told me, is one guy is telling us, um, who was looking for a stupa. And that must have been Franke because Franke was mentioning that in his, uh, account of his uh, uh, antiquities of in, uh, Indian Tibet, as he was calling it. That's why I came up with the title Indian Tibet, Tibetan India. And that stupa was never um, documented by him. I don't know, maybe he didn't find it, maybe he didn't uh, care to go there. We um, documented it and it was a great find because it's the only stupa, to my knowledge, which features a three dimensional mandala in the, on the top, on the ceiling, Nakshobhya mandala. Great uh, drawing, great paintings on the walls, on the cubus of the stupa, of the churton, um, which are later, they are like 14th century Drigun Kagyupa informed central Tibetan style. Um, there you can see um, how from Akshobhya, this is typical for the later developments of Tibetan Buddhism, where Akshobhya, the blue Buddha, became the central Buddha and pushed Vairochana, so to say, to the side. And but the, the paintings, nevertheless, are wonderful. And for me, to my amazement, is mainly the central uh, deities that are um, painted with the most care. Um, let's have a look real quick uh, into Guge, because that might not be that familiar for you in, in, the, in the West Tibetan side, uh, the, the capital Toling. Um, I got to include this into my book, uh, mainly because of the work of other people, uh, Francois, uh, um, um, not Francois Panier, um, a person who, a gentleman who worked in, from France in, in uh, West Tibet. Um, he, he supplied many of his photographs that he uh, was able to take there in the 80s and the 90s. And uh, when you see that, you can see the, the terrible destruction that took place in West Tibet. This was all roof. These were all the, the, the halos that you see were all filled with statues. So what you saw as small statues or small sculptures on the walls in Tabo and on the ceiling of that stupa, they were all standing figures in Toling Monastery, which are gone now. You can see the holes 
which carried the uh, installment uh, um, rods where they were placed into the walls. Um, for me, it's amazing. I think the Chinese, they, they, they did not in this cultural revolution in the 60s, they did not, as in other places, uh, uh, turn the whole thing down or destroy it completely. They left it staying like a memorial somehow because that place actually was where Tibet came, uh, became Buddhist from. That, that was the starting point for the final conversion of the Tibetans to Buddhism in their special way of to be, uh, Buddhism, of course. So somehow they left much of ruins to remain as a reminder probably of the strength of the Chinese. And I ran into a, a, a map of a British um, resident who was stationed in Yangtze by the British after they had left, um, the young husband um, expedition had left trying to establish relationship with military means, of course, as the British were uh, with Tibet. And he made this drawing where, he, where you see where he accessed Tolin, the, um, the Chekor, the, the, the holy ground, and all the small circles you see in his, in his drawing show um, what you have seen just now as uh, empty shrines. Those were all figures, all sculptures that were there and that are now destroyed and gone. So for me, it was a very terrible thing to see how many, how much cultural destruction had actually taken place there in the 1960s. Now the Chinese are trying to reconstruct these places, but naturally it's not the same anymore. We can see that the destruction taking place uh, through the old photographs taken by Tucci. Uh, Franke was given the possibility to travel there, but he denied. Unfortunately, he went on from Narco into Spiti Valley, which also, uh, Tucci also took, but he also took the sidestep into West Tibet, and he made those photographs there. And this is the result after the Cultural Revolution and the way it looks still today. Um, a view into the uh, White Temple in, in Toling, um, uh, I'm sorry, it's um after the destruction of Tsaparan being a later establishment for the kings, more secluded, um, um, which didn't escape destruction anyhow. Um, when I saw these uh, images, I was, of course, very, very sad, depressed and down, but I always looked also at the paintings, which are next to those destroyed um, clay figures. And much to my surprise, um, as Lionel Fournier's photograph showed the French person who supplied all his uh, stock images to my um, book, um, those were still in pretty decent shape. Um, of course, water leakage coming in, but nevertheless, you could find out the iconogra iconography, you could find out the theme of the of the uh, wall paintings. And so it was for the first time ever possible in my book, uh, Google Ages of Gold, that those um, paintings in, in good quality are shown in a book and are discussed iconographically, are discussed on a comprehensive scale uh, with a lot of photographs. Unfortunately, that book is not available anymore. And it's um, traded on the internet with astonishing prices. I wish I could get some uh, percentage of uh, 1200 euro being you know, um, um, paid for the Google book at present, if you find it anyhow on the internet. We're looking at reprinting uh, it, but uh, so far um, it's not in sight possibly within the next five years. Um, we're coming to a close or almost uh, to the end. Um, in 2008, as I told you, I started traveling the Western Himalayas again, which I continuously pursued from 1987 till 2000 and let's say two or something. And um, 2008, coming back with Tering Angchuk, uh, providing um, um, his wonderful um, services and also his expertise on places like this is another uh, find that I was able to achieve through him because 
Same thing with uh, like the Trakunkovace caves. He told me when I said, um, I heard that Mangyu Monastery uh, is supposed to be um, containing old paintings. Nobody had ever written about it. I saw one, two photographs in a guidebook, which were rather insig insignificant. He said, well, let's go there. It's a bit like Alci. And then when we get, got there, I was completely uh, knocked off the ground that there are six temples that contain murals in the style um, as Alci does. So I started to do some photographs. Naturally, in the last two days that I was in Ladakh, I could not do all the work. But I uh, tried to come back in the next spring in March. I had my first winter experience in Ladakh. Um, traveling there by minus 10 degrees, doing the work of documenting the wall paintings of Mangyu Monastery and bringing out the book Heavenly Himalayas, uh, Discoveries in Ladakh, uh, or the wall paintings of Mangyu and other discoveries in Ladakh, where you also find Sasputse, Trakunkovace, and Nyoma inside that book. That is still around in the inter on the internet. And it was amazing. It was just amazing. And there, for now, I can see the importance of this work because among you what you see in my book is not there anymore there was the effort of um, either asi or some some company tried to um, redo the roofing of among you because they meant well because there was leakage coming in then when they were starting their work, the whole roof collapsed and all the straw and all the mud and everything was crashing against the walls. So this painting that you see here is not there anymore. It has been repainted, it has been redone, but the original uh, style of the 11th century, it's a contemporary of the first original uh, monas uh, monastic buildings established in thousand, 85,095 in Alci, those are not to be seen anymore, which is an absolute loss and an absolute pity. Um, these are unique ones. The, those images are probably done by the same workshops that worked in Alci, but they did not put these things there. We already, we also know who um, commissioned those. This is the same monk uh, who was supported by the Drill clan like Rinchen Zangpo, who came from Mangyu and wanted to have, like in Sumda is another place uh, where the, the great um, restorers, th those were not responsible for that accident there in Mangyu, not at all, uh, probably would have happened for, to them. It's an accident, no one to blame. But the restorers that I worked in Trakon Kovace with, who worked with Jigmit Namyal, they also worked in Sumna, did an amazing job restoring the, the, fresh, the, fresh, sorry, the paintings and the roofs there. And uh, um, the person who built Mangyu and Alchi came from Sumda, and he had monasteries built uh, that he liked also there uh, next to the great monastic complex of Alchi. And it's, it's, it's wonderful paintings that are there. We, uh, with an architect uh, from Grace University in Austria, we even took uh, room plans there. Those are in the book. Um, we discovered um, things that are akin to, um, next to Alcios to Tabo there on this, on this doti of this four meter high um, Maitreya sculpture. There is a, um, a narrative various narratives, uh, um, for example, this is the narrative on Sudana, which is also in Tabu Monastery, Norzang in India, uh, in Tibetan. Uh, by the way, the Sudana story is also at the Borobudur in Java with the same uh, cosmic principle of the Vajradhatu Mandala and various other um, uh, Jataka stories, like the one sacrificing himself, the prince sacrificing himself, um, and, and the Apsaras taking away his head to the heavens. And the amazing thing is we find the same um, way of depicting the donors or the kings that were um, responsible for the building of the monastery. So this is like real archaeological and art historic fieldwork now where you find that uh, 
paintings, wall paintings, contain the same messages or are stylistically the same like in other places. And then having somebody around who's able to read the wall inscriptions and then getting the connections together, um, the findings were that actually uh, it was possible to establish a chronology between Mangyu, Sumda, and the temples of Alchi. We'll get to that in a bit. Also, stylistically, there are many similarities, like these are Sasanian roundels, which are on the ceiling paintings of Mangyu, and uh, they show uh, Indian fabled animals or um, bulls, griffins, uh, lions, and in the middle and in the round you find the Sasanian pearl roundels, which are also, of course, as many of you probably know, in Alchi. This is the end of my presentation. This is like up until now the climax of my work um, because I pursued the possibility, the um, permission to work in Alchi for as long as I have been traveling in the Western Himalayas. It started in 93 when I first accessed uh, the Sumtsek and the Dukhan in uh, the Alchi Chekor um, because the art there is just without comparison. It's none of the art that I've been showing you is with compa any comparison in the world. But here it's like from a quality standpoint of, and from the way it has been preserved from preservation standpoint, it is just without comparison. So it was never possible. The only photographs that were taken were uh, from uh, Aditya Arya, um, who did a great exhibition in, uh, in Delhi in the museum, uh, the National Museum. Um, before that, from the Western side, it was a few photographs or the big research project that took place with the uh, University of Applied Sciences in Cologne, together with the uh, University of Vienna. But the material that they gathered together was taken in the 80s. And so after that, it was impossible for anybody from a Western side to get a permission. The reason for that being almost the same like why people are all apprehensive and I think it's justified, it's absolutely correct because many times I must admit for my creed, for my Western researchers, uh, not to generalize, but many times people come with an attitude telling the people you know, it's good for them if somebody reaches his, uh, researches on their premises and the people get nothing out of it. They, they don't understand, they don't know why the local people, and also then if any permission is given, nothing is returned, in, nothing is given in return. And the way I got this permission was only because of long, long discussions in which I not sacrificed, but happily gave half of everything to Alchi Monastery. So half of the income coming from the book goes to the monastery, which is Likia Monastery, that takes care of, the, of Alchi. Um, any, all the photographs that I took are with Alchi Monastery. And I'm trying with my exhibitions, that is, as Wood de Jong was saying in the beginning, before we started the lecture, my friend from Holland, um, starting a big exhibition in Hamburg now. We're trying to raise the awareness and trying to get people to, um, pay into a fund so that we get, get funds together for a good um, conservation work also eventually also in Alchi. It will take still some time of convincing uh, work, but so far the monks are already um, knowledgeable about certain or many of the difficulties that are, uh, are taking place in Alchi. One of the reasons why I was able also to work there was because I was approached by a company that does the cameras with the cameras, but this camera is called phase one. They are doing cameras, middle, uh, medium format cameras with a, a sensor that has 100 to 150 megapixel. That means that you can create images which are 1.5 meters high in printing resolution. So for an exhibition like I'm doing it now in Hamburg, uh, where we raise uh, the artworks to the original sizes of about four meters, um, you only have to um, expand 
the image twice of its size. So it's really not that big of a deal and the quality is still amazing. So everybody was really high on this camera and it shows any, any single brush stroke, it shows all the details, it shows anything, everything with clarity. So for the first time ever, and thanks to technology, which has gone so far in the last few years, um, now we have a, a documentation which probably will take years till a better quality of camera will develop, be developed. And I mean, those photographs are so big, you won't probably ever need anything bigger than that. Um, we were allowed by the grace of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama and his younger brother, uh, Nari Rinpoche, um, to access every single floor of Alchi, all the places which are not accessible to any uh, visitor there because of um, conservator conservatory um, issues, you know, the, the place is quite unstable and more access of more people would create more problems. So what you see here with ladders or with uh, um, difficult accessibility was the same for us, but we were allowed for one or two days to get into there and to do our documentation work. One of the great finds for me coming from a Western European background was that Alci is probably the only place in the world where you find Greek wooden architecture, wooden temple architecture. Like what you see here contains all the, um, all the features of a Greek temple. You find an architrave, you find triglyphs, uh, glyphs, triglyphs, those three small um, uh, columns that you see here. You find metopes, which are the um, pictorial, uh, freezes where you in on, on the Acropolis or on the Parthenon you find those heroes fighting. Um, there you find Buddha statues. You find the dentil decor, which is also on Greek architecture. And then you find the columns, of course, with with uh, with the volutes like you have in Dorian architecture. So I think through Gandhara, Kashmir has preserved the Greek wooden architecture there, which is a great archaeological find because so far there's a big fight between uh, Greek historians or historians on Greek, on ancient Greek, Greece, if there have been uh, wooden temples at all, because nothing like that is prepared. Alci in the Western Himalayas on 3,200 meters height might be a proof for the thesis that wooden architecture, wooden temple architecture existed in ancient Greece. Um, iconographically, but also of course, you know, art historically, um, aesthetically, I mean, this was like tour de force in Alci. The Sumtsek temple contains three main uh, monumental sculptures, all four meter and 60 uh, in height. Um, Avalokiteshvara uh, on the southern side being a more of a protective deity here because uh, compassion, um, as was typical for the Guge time coming for the concept coming from Central Asia, from the caves of Dunhuang, where compassion was actually understood as a protection against the means of hatred. So with compassion, you could get all the dangers, you could get across all dangers and it would all resolve in, in the compassionate being. That's why Avalokiteshvara has been placed there on this part of the wall. You have Manjushri as the wisdom, wisdom and compassion, the main um, principles of Tibetan Buddhism, of course, of Buddhism at all. And you have Maitreya as the center, as the coming Buddha, um, the synopsis of those two. When he comes, the new uh, age will start, the new world time will start. And so he's placed into the uh, central niche of the Sumtsek Temple, the free uh, storage Sumtsek Temple. What is amazing art-wise, again, is that the dotis of those deities, as we've seen in Mangyu, but here to a much higher degree, are painted. And they are painted, again, with miniature paintings. Like we have uh, paintings there which are about five centimeters in height or in width, not more than that. And those are even painted with shades and uh, with small details, like these are um, 
riders coming from the kingdom of Guge. On the left, we, we find a king. He wears a crown and possibly kings that came from Toling because we find a, a, a structure there, which is a three-story three temple, which is also the golden temple in Toling. Could also be Alchi itself. The Sumtsek temple uh, is three is a three um, tire structure as well. So it could be that these are kings from Guge coming into Western Tibet into that part which had not been part of the kingdom before and bringing the new religion into that region. Um, we find uh, Sasanian informed, Sogdian informed, uh, but then placed into a Kashmiri or West Tibetan background, um, riders again on the ceilings also, like we had before uh, in Mangyu just as well. So the, the horse has a big importance there as a, as a means of power, as a means of crossing long distances. What actually those kings of Kuge were actually, a, a they had the necessity of doing. Um, we find very similar um, depictions of kings. And what this new research on Google is, um, has brought forward is a first understanding why, for the first time ever, these kings are wearing non-Tibetan costumes. Like in uh, Mangyu, if you remember that photograph that I showed you, and this one, we see these are not Tibetan costumes. The lady on the right side who is holding uh, that bowl, she is wearing a West Tibetan dress with the with the uh, perak, with the, with the, um, the turquoise uh, stones along the hair. She has her hair in 108 um, tails, but, and, and the rest is typical West Tibetan. But the man in the middle, the no, noble person, the king, he is wearing what is actually a Central Asian dress. And for the last um, 40 years, people were, were asking themselves, why is he wearing, uh, why are these, these kings wearing dresses which, which have Sasanian, Sogdian uh, roundels with, with um, Greek appearing tigers or, um, sorry, lions inside, which came from a Sasanian, Sogdian background. Well, the reason for that is being that the kings of West Tibet were deprived. They were the old kings of central Tibet. And when in the ninth century, there was this big turmoil, which we know from, from the um, chronicles of the kings of West Tibet, which were only translated in 1996 uh, from Tibetan into uh, Western to English language. Those were deprived of the, their original throne. And at that time, the central Tibetan kingdom involved places up to the Silk Road, up to places which are now Central Asia, Kazakhstan, uh, even Uzbekistan, the Dunhuang Caves were part of the Central Tibetan Empire, even uh, to places which had access to Eastern Iran and where textiles were bartered on the Silk Road trade routes, which came from Iran and which actually by the Sogdian kings were uh, placed onto the Silk Road, which we find now in Japan, from Japan up to Venice. And the reason why in this late period of West Tibetan supremacy in that region, why the kings were deciding to have themselves um, depicted in Central Asian costumes is because they were claiming with Central Tibetan attire, the throne or the, the, the um, that the throne of central Tibet still belongs to them. They were never fighting for the central Tibetan throne. There, were no, there was no warship taking place against it, but they were at least showing their supremacy to the people that they were you know, getting as new um, inhabitants of the West Tibetan kingdom of Guga to show them the nobility that exceeded even the locality of West Tibet. By the way, that's also the reason why they were all you know, focusing on Vairochana as the central white and central uh, god from which everything evolved in this universe, because they, those cults were already practiced by their ancestors in central Tibet, as Amy Heller was proving for the 8th, 9th century in Lhasa, in shrines. So naturally it was their way of sticking to their old tradition, because the kings of central Tibet were descendants 
or were understood to be his descendants from Vairochana as the highest Buddhist deity. On a more um, smaller level, we were able to find amazing things also archaeologically, also historically. This is like a very faded um, painting which shows um, an Iranian Indian fire deity. It has uh, features of um, a Hindu deity eating the fire because of the exposed belly. It has the tongs in his hand. It has uh, an, um, uh, the, the, the metal thing on which as a smith. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't get you. I think somebody unmuted the mic uh, accidentally. Okay. So that's what we were hearing. Okay. We're almost done. Um, you can see the anvil in the middle. I don't know, maybe I have the mouse here. This is the anvil in between. These are the tongs. Uh, there is the hammer. And um, it was really interesting to see. There are some, I think in Kulu Valley, there is a deity which is still um, revered as a, a, the, the, the deity of blacksmiths. But the background of it came clear to me because I could find uh, a coin on the internet by the British Numismatic Society that was selling that coin, where you can see the exactly the same iconography. You find a fire in the background, a fire halo. You find the tongs and you find the hammer and you find the anvil. So this coming from a, from a Zoroastrian, this is a Zoroastrian uh, coin. Uh, and that deity in Iran was called Atosho. Um, I wasn't aware of that Indian deity that also is, uh, uh, has the same iconography back then. So I placed it into a book as, um, as we can see, as was coming from the Silk Road um, from Iran, Eastern Iran, as another um, evidence for that um, idea that um, the Silk Road had a big, big, big influence on the art of Alchi at that time. Um, amazing paintings, just to show you a few, which are in my latest book, Alchi, Treasure of the Himalayas, on uh, 422 pages with 600 photographs, all in greatest quality because of the camera and because of Hirma Publishers that has done a great, great, great job. Um, all, I think, flawless. That doesn't mean because of my great photography, but because I had great lamps, I had this great um, camera and uh, was able to work for some time and uh, I hope that this book will serve as a, as, a, as, as a base for being able to access or to see where all the difficulties lie. Like, just look at this Tara panel where you see everywhere there are the cracks here and immediately um, it is necessary to have some conservation work taking place, but good conservationists and little conservation. We, we have to be, as a long research has to run into this um, uh, because it's still a seismic, uh, still seismic activity in Ladakh and you never know what's going to happen when you start fixing a, a hole here. It might as well just break right next to it. So I'm not an expert in this. All I can do is provide uh, the, the base. Like here, look at this again here. The, provide the base uh, with my work in order that hopefully one day this place will be preserved. Um, when I was doing this lecture in Ladakh, Sonali will remember, I finished it off with uh, those terrible images which I will spare you of, of the, um, the bombing of the Buddhas and Bamiyan in Afghanistan and how easily it can you know, take place that things that we cherish and that are unique in the world are gone because this is like very close to the Indo-Pakistan border. And we just seen re recently what happened with the Chinese infiltration in Ladakh. And you never know what's gonna happen. And I hope that unlike in Mangyu, where my book is the last place where you can find original um, views of the way it used to be that Alchi and also Tabo and also the other places will be preserved for good and for a very, very long time. I hope I was able to 
transpose a bit of the fascination that I had in my 30 years. And I hope that this time will go on. And one day I will do my survey on Kinari architecture or whatever. Um, um, I hope that I was able to excite you a bit about this place, about these places, and also make you understand why it took 30 years to get all this done, because it's a vast amount of material that is worth looking at and worth researching on. And I hope that Sonali with her institute, with her very, uh, very varied uh, approach to things will eventually expand and go also into the interiors and have people with her that are also interested in this. But any work I think that is to be done is necessary and good. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much for joining from all around the world. And after a little zip of water to get my speech on again, I'm really happy to answer some questions if there may be any of them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Peter, for that wonderful, enthralling journey. And uh, you mentioned that maybe we got excited a bit. I don't think so. We are so very excited that, uh, you know, let the Corona thing just, you know, die out. And I think all of us will be zipping past the Himalayas to all these places that you have, uh, you know, reintroduced. And it's, it's, uh, it's, com it's amazing. I would like to applause you, you know, for the amazing work that you have done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers. And uh, at this point, I would ask everybody to please go mute and uh, we can take uh, questions. Uh, if you could raise your hands, we can take questions one by one. Um, uh, and before anyone uh, raises the questions, I have a uh, suggestion, Peter. You, mm -hmm. You've done such uh, incredible work, you know, with the Duwang uh, caves in China on the Silk Road. They had this immersive experience in, in the Getty uh, a year or so ago. Have yep. you thought of uh, doing something like that in immersive three, 3D stereoscopic kind of? Uh... Yeah, in fact, I was asked by a museum director in Frankfurt who was really, is, is it on? Yeah, um, who was really fascinated by Tabo and he did something like that on Greek gods. He had like a niche of interest saying that the, the Greek gods or the Greek sculptures were actually painted. All we know of them is white uh, marble or whatever statues, but originally those um, gods were all painted. So when I showed him my, um, my pictures from Tabo and telling him that actually in Tibetan Buddhism, also in India of anywhere, the, the, there are certain um, iconographies connected to colors, he was completely thrilled. Um, the problem is with people, anybody here in the West, they're all very, very busy. They're all involved in their own subjects. Like he was doing this, he's done the third exhibition on Greek painted gods already. Yeah? And so after one year of trying to work with him, I just gave up because it was nothing coming about. And that is the main thing with most of the, of the um, uh, academic circles, you could say, that um, it's your own initiative. They're happy to accept you, like the, that uh, exhibition that I'm doing in Hamburg. It's my own initiative. But if I would go to them and ask them, would you like to join and would we do something together also financially, it would probably not come about or come about only very, very, very late, you know. So that's why I'm doing these things. But you know, 3D work in these monasteries, those are still places of worship, you know. So it's very, very, um, you have to be cautious, you have to be uh, sensitive, and I'm happy to be that way because I don't want to intrude. And like, we, that's why I came to Alchi in, in the late fall, that was November, it was again freezing. <laughs> but at that time, mo mostly nobody was there anymore. So we could really do our work without disturbing anybody who was doing you know, service or trying to, to pray or whatever in there. And, and, and I think that's still very important, but it's a good idea. But um, actually since in Dunhuang it's possible because it's just a tourist place, but in these places, it's probably too crowded still or too much of a um, uh, active place, I would say. Yeah, but some exhibition on a large scale of the wonderful work that you've done, it's so important that people see what you've done, you know, 
um, not everyone would be able to get the books, but in the museum, it's a place where the common person can actually access. So uh, what I'm happy to do is like, um, day after tomorrow, the production for this exhibition in Hamburg starts. The Hamburg exhibition is supposed to be in many different places. It will be, if all goes well with uh, coronavirus, in New York in April of next year at the Tibet house there. Um, it will be in Bremen, which is another town in, in Germany. It will be in Switzerland, where I uh, usually often exhibit things. And I'm very open because it's a tailor-made exhibition, tailor-made to, to places. It can be done any way the museum is. In Hamburg, it's like four meter high walls. And this is like a 3D uh, installation already because the photographs will actually show the interiors of Alci of course, tailor-made to that room. It's not exactly Alci, but because of the height of the walls, it's almost life-size as an Alci itself. So this is a bit like a 3D thing. And due to the amazing quality of the camera, you get the feeling of being inside and the lighting, of course, in the room. It looks a bit as if you are in, in, in the room itself. And I'm very happy if anybody of you is connected to National Museum, um, Aditya Arya, who was there after we left uh, the, the, the chat last time on Sunday, he, he said, let's get in touch and do something together with his work and my work. So I'm very open very, and it's very cheap. The, the production of the prints is not very, very expensive. It's done on wallpapers that you paste on your walls and that gives it that look actually of wall paintings, you know, because it's not glossy, it's not shiny, it's the way it's done in the monastery. So that way, uh, production costs are quite low. And so I'm very, very open to doing that anywhere in the world. It can be done, maybe the lady from Singapore, Tara, has some connections, anybody. I mean, and the files can be sent via the internet, so it's all possible. Yeah, Happy. at the Getty, at UCLA, or in the Kulu Valley. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about it. Remember that? Yeah. We talked about it already. And let's see, I mean, uh, Tibet House is very, very happy from New York to pass these wallpapers on. I mean, what are they supposed to do with that? I'm trying to sell them after the um, show is over in Hamburg in order to raise funds for the conservation work in, 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 uh, in Alci. But you never know. But and, we, they are too precious to be put into the garbage. So anybody who wants to pick them up is happy to do it. I mean, for an exhibition or so. Yeah, we will, we will, we will talk. I think there's so many uh, scholars here. I'm sure they will talk uh, to the people. I'll, I'll talk to the people I know at the National Museum, Peter. So Great. yes, love to. Yeah, that would be wonderful. So do we do we have questions? Do we have questions? Any? I, I can see. Dr. Anjali is there. All of us, all of uh, our regulars are here. Uh, anybody has a question for Peter? You've left us speechless, basically. You know that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the uh, lecture was so good. All, no, no questions anymore. Everything is clear. So, <laughs> thank you. Best compliment I can get. <laughs> Could I? And the rest is in the books, of course. So, yeah. <laughs> Could I say something? Please, of yes. Uh, I think, um, well, I have to ask Peter if I could have his email or something, because I am okay. actually a volunteer at the Museums of Singapore. We have an Wonderful. organization. I'll try and find out. There may be an interest here. We have the Asian Civilizations Museum, which mm -hmm. is very involved with these kinds of things. It, mm -hmm. would, it would need some months' notice and all that. I don't know what would come of it. But Alchi has been there for almost a thousand years, so take yes, your time. <laughs> I know about it. I'm actually a Buddhist now. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, so we read a lot about Rinchen Zanko and all that. Great. Uh, so, but this is a separate thing. This is the art museums. Mm -hmm. So uh, if I can have your email and I'll send yeah. you mine. You we know, had been on this uh, chat before, so I'll, I'll give it to you there. And I can give it also openly. I mean, I have a website called petervanham.com. And this is like info or uh, peter at petervanham.com. And there you can easily access it or via the Facebook page or Messenger or whatever. And I'll also post your email ID on the WhatsApp group. And Peter, That's I fine. don't think you're 
are you a part of the group if you're Which not one? i'm going to add you and i'll have to have i'll have to remove somebody to add you so <laughs> because <laughs> we already reached our limit but i'm going to do that hate me. don't do that if you hate me bad karma <laughs> yeah. Don't remove anybody from me. We'll be in touch like that. And I'm on your Facebook page. I've, I've, uh, uh, what do you call that when you, when you get the messages from somebody, f just like that without asking. This okay, you I'm follow at. them. <laughs> you follow them. You. Okay. Yeah. So, if possible, I actually have a question. I couldn't figure out how to raise my hand, though. I'm sorry. Um, I just like in person, I guess. Um, right. My question for you was, you've gotten to see a lot of these sites and watch them kind of evolve and, and change over time, which is something that a lot of people don't get to experience. Um, have you noticed that, of course, there's going to be wear and tear of these, you know, incredible sites that happens over time. But do you ever do you ever find the practices of like the locals who still use these sites to ever be, um, in fact, uh, degrading to the site in terms of like just like causing it to wear and tear faster than it would normally mm. well there are two sides to this one is that the people are still really appreciating them they're very careful about them um, uh, on the other hand there are practices which are naturally um, going to be degrading like uh, touching something like when you when you like we all know these these uh, sculptures possibly from the Kulu Valley and other places where the faces are rubbed down, rubbed down so much that you don't make them out anymore. And this is because when you touch a deity or touch an image, the blessing is supposed to come onto you. So, but that, you know, those, those places, some of those places like Tabo and Alchi had been under archeological survey of India. So what they did, they put some, some fencing in front of the, the, the old uh, parts of the shrine. But um, someone who is really, really devote, devoted, he will bend over them and touch the image anyhow. But there are, there are um, initiatives of um, making the people understand that um, you can worship also in a place which is not as old as this one. For example, in Tabo, there's a new Lakang build, a new temple built, where people can circumambulate, where there are tankas, where there's a big Buddha statue. And they are you know, encouraged to go to that place. Many times the people also go to the old place, which is fine. If they, like, they have watched people there and then they tell them, please don't touch it like that. Um, so, heed the warnings um, and on the other hand they they, they um, do th like trying to preserve the place for example in Alchi there are no butter lamps anymore because butter lamps they would have a lot of soot coming from the from the fire and from the from the butter which is inside and that used to put a lot of uh, um, varnish onto the paintings so now there is it's quite funny actually because it's like a container with hundreds of butter lamps inside. So anybody who wants to light a butter lamp goes there, puts it there, then they put on a ventilator because it's so hot <laughs> that the whole place is about to explode because of all the heat there. Yeah? But they have, you know, they open it up, then they try to put um, air condition inside. So there's things taking place um, that, that prevent the place from being degraded. On the other hand, it's like a, you try to find a middle path between having the people, um, the, giving the right to the people to worship it, but at the same time trying to protect the monument. So Peter, that was great. She was one of my former students who has been to the Kulu Valley and she's, an, I would say an anthropological archeologist, Grace. Yes? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, probably. Okay. <laughs> Lovely to see you. And it's good uh, to see you too. Thank you, Peter, for the presentation. It was very informative. Thank you. So, Peter, we have Jenny. Jenny, you can take on to the mic. Uh, she has a question. Yeah, I was. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, I was wondering if you have a spiritual connection to the Himalayas, if at all. Um, I wouldn't call myself a Buddhist, but a spiritual connection is certainly there. 
I learned a lot from that philosophy. I put that philosophy into my daily life, into my daily um, dealing with people. I'm trying at least. Um, I feel a strong devotion and energy once I am there in these places. I don't practice at home. I don't have the time yet and the, the calmness, I think. Um, my days are very, very full. I'm like, as a teacher, I start at eight. Um, before that, possibly because of the evenings before, I'm too tired to get up for meditation or something. But then when I come home, after, you know, in Germany, we're lucky our school ends at one or one thirty, and then we have the day off till the next day and a lot of vacation. Then I'm, you know, involved in my work and my research work and in my, you know, presentation work or whatever there is. Um, so I'm looking forward to the retirement time, I must say, in that regard, that, you know, finally I can really get into the scriptures a little more that I've been writing about. Um, sometimes I find it quite difficult as a Westerner to have, you know, to develop all that bhakti and all that devotion. That sometimes is quite hard for me to be upfront and honest because like our approach in the West is quite intellectual, although I'm a, um, a person which is more feeling oriented, you could say, but the approach towards um, research is quite intellectual. Um, it's iconography, it's archaeology, so more the, the science aspect in it. And right now I still have the feeling that this is what I want to do and this is what I am good at. And this is where I want, still want to achieve things and publish things and get things to the open uh, to share what I am so happy about. But I think as soon as this is over and I've turned whatever, if I may turn 70 or something, I think that aspect will be much stronger. And I can't wait to actually read a Prajnaparamita manuscript, but I can read Sanskrit, I can read Tibetan, so it always has to be translation. So I'm not sure if that's going to do me as much good as I, or as much fascination as I'm, you know, looking forward to, to experiencing it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jenny. And um, at this point, I want to make an, another announcement. Uh, next Sunday at 4 p.m., we will have Dr. Shubra Sharma talk about the emergent Himalaya, climate, ecology, and people. That would be at 4 p.m. next Sunday, uh, which is uh, the 12th of July. Uh, so all of those who are present here, please take a note of that. And uh, Peter, of course, please uh, join us in all uh, our talks yeah. whenever you can. Um, I show my, my pictures of the Sanska Glacier. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> and, uh, and Peter, I really want, uh, you know, all of, because I have seen uh, the film that you showed, I really want all our audience to uh, know about your work. So if you could send us a link and I can upload it uh, to YouTube with your permission. I would love to circulate that film so that Thank everybody you. knows about your work. Thank you very much. I'll do that. For those but, who don't uh, know, a lot know. But. The ones that I had in this lecture before were more like um, underlying my commentaries, like showing where we were going for a short time. But the Tabo one, uh, that can be done, or also what I had on Vincent Zanko and other things. I can, I can send you some links. Lovely. And I do want to talk about Tabo. In 2017, I and Rajiv, you know, who works, uh, we work together here. He's actually right here. Let me just... Introduce him, yeah. him. That's Rajiv. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we went to uh, uh, Tabo and oh my God, even now in 2017, the route to Tabo is uh, anything short of a, a disaster waiting to happen. Uh, and I looked That's down right. and he was driving and I was like, oh my God, will we survive? How did, did you, you manage? Did you go by a Rotang Pass, Rotang and Kunsum Pass or how did you go? Yes, yes, through that area, through Kaza, Spiti, Kunzum uh, Pass, yeah. And, uh, you know, that whole place where the cliff is kind of just merging into the river. And I am like, 2017, it's like that. How did you manage that years ago with, how did Mohit, you know, get you out there? Ask him if he's still there. Mohit, you still there? 
<laughs> I don't know if well, you, you should ask me about how we managed with that old car. I mean, Mo, it was just the guy who the contracted for that vehicle, but he was not part of it. But is he there? Let me see if Mo. Yeah, yeah, I'm here, Peter. Mo, yeah, yeah, sure, tell us, give us yeah. your secrets. <laughs> <laughs> A good driver will take you anywhere. Yeah? <laughs> Well, it's, all you need is a good driver. Yeah, and that we had with him, and also with yeah. the people that worked for him. It was always good. And uh, the the homesick person, you know, he's yeah. it was great. Mo, it was just starting out when we came to to Shimla. He Sumpal, opened his name was Sumpal, yeah? 1993, and uh, uh, Sumfal, exactly that was his name. Yeah. And you know, he really requested me to say, "What can I do better if I want to succeed in travel business?" I said, "Well." There's nothing you could do then when we were starting out, but for the next time, try to get a driver who is experienced up there and who is not falling homesick after the first <laughs> corner behind the Shimla. <laughs> and but, you know, sometimes it's sometimes it's also uh, no 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 pain no gain. One has to say because Again. I remember once I think Moid was there. We were um, close to Dunkar. And there was this landslide coming down. We saw it, and I don't know if Moid was there, but we said, listen, if we don't speed up now, we're gonna be stuck here because there was another landslide behind us at Narco, that Marling slide, which is there. So we would have been stuck for three months. So let's speed, let's go. And like the, the, the mud came behind us between our, our rear, act, uh, rear wheels, just like that, we just passed through. And sometimes a good driver is also somebody who puts his foot on the gas. <laughs> but it was terrible. It was dangerous. It was really giving me a heart attack. <laughs> and but I it remember, is like that. Is, I remember in 2017. The only thing that, sorry, so nearly, the only thing that is good on that road is that part which is just near the Tibetan border because that is maintained by the, by the army. By the army. The rest of it, like where all these these dams are, like the near um, where the Sutlitch, uh is, is put under those dam constructions, this is terrible. I mean, the the Canadians that were doing the work there, they were not caring anything about the roads. It was like I don't know. <laughs> the roads are still bad there, and also when we were going there, I saw this person who was sitting very calmly, and I think the Buddhist attitude makes you like that. Such a harsh landscape. And he was sitting and I was like, what is he looking at? And I looked on the left side and I saw a toppled truck and I was like, oh my goodness. And he's very, very calm. And uh, that's... Well, you know, Buddhist monks go to graveyards to meditate. So he probably had the same thing without having to go to a graveyard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, we are planning to go again. Uh, to do some surveys and uh, explore uh, bits and pieces of caves and things like that. So maybe, you know, on the footsteps of Peter Van Ham will be our... Peter Van Ham. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I believe there's another question. Um, Jenny, uh -huh. you had another question, is it? Yeah, I, I uh, was just wondering... Um, when when did the idea of setting out for the Himalayas germinate in your mind? Was it before, when you were very young, or what was the attraction in the first place? Because I know at, at the age of 11 that I wanted to go to America, so. Uh -huh. Okay. I think my first, um, well, it had to do, first of all, with, with my ex-wife, who was in India when she was 16. And that experience changed her life. And we were going out together then. And when she came back, you know, everything was smelling after incense and <laughs> all those wide baggy trousers. So she was doing a complete personality change coming back from India. And um, she, she went to, with, with you know, regular tourism uh, groups to, uh, Bhutan and Sikkim and also to Ladakh and she really got me hooked I must say you know the pictures that I saw and all that um, so the first journey we were doing together still in 1986 that went to Nepal 
and there immediately was, you know, of course, with the Tibetan exile community. And then we went to Dharamsala, which is the exile seat of His Holiness. Um, so even more Tibetan Buddhism. And then she was, uh, she wanted to see other uh, Swamis, like we went to Sai Baba and went to uh, Aurobindo Ashram, which to me what was not that fascinating anymore, also to her not. And then we broke up and uh, that still stuck with me, that, that whole um, flair and that whole, um, how do you say, enthusiasm for it. And I immediately started looking for regions in the Himalayas, which were at least more untouched than what she had seen before, like with a regular tourist group going to Bhutan or to Sikkim and many tourists being there. I thought there must be something there which is still quite untouched. That got me hooked to the kingdom of Mustang in, in, in Nepal. But when I, it was also impossible to access. I read the book by Michel Pessel, The Forbidden Kingdom in the Himalayas. That was a huge impact on me because um, like he was there in 1964 and then the place was closed because of the Chinese invasion. Um, Pesel wrote the foreword, by the way, to the book Indian Tibet, Tibet and India shortly before he died. Um, that's even also a nice story. If I could tell that real quick, Michel Pesel is an anthropologist, British anthropologist coming from Paris actually, but he grew up in, 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 in England. And he was the first to come to Mustang. He was the first to work on Sanskar. And he, I contacted him as I contact always people, try to contact people that are um, interested in a certain area or have done work on a certain area, because I think the, the um, exploratory work and the ground work they have been doing is always praiseworthy. And so he went to Dahanu also, which is a region in Ladakh, uh, that Indo-Aryan region on the Pakistan border. And he got expelled from India and he was blacklisted for 30 years and he could not access India anymore. And when I contacted him, which through the internet became possible, he said, you are going to Sanskar? Oh my God, this is amazing. Please take a letter and some money for my old monk friend along. And we met this person and the letter said that uh, the monk, uh, he, in, fa in fact, it was, I think, $1,000 that was in this letter. And with this $1,000, Michel Pissel wanted this monk to travel to Paris to meet him. He even had arranged for a visa for the guy in Delhi. So because of poverty, he was not able to leave Sanskar and all of a sudden he had the money, he took the money, Went to, went to France, he had the letter of, of reference so that, that Michel would pay for everything. And this is how our connection came. And he was so full of gratitude for this because after 30 years, he could see one of his best friends again. He, Michel could not go to India. The monk could not go out of India. So we put them together. And then he wanted to visit us. We wanted to meet in place in, the, in person for the first time for the Frankfurt Book Fair. And he was about to leave on the train from Paris to Frankfurt. And the fortnight before he died, he had a heart attack and was no more. So I was really, really connected with him because of his book. I wanted to go to Mustang. Then it was $100 a day by the Nepali government, immediately tracking permit to go there. I couldn't afford that in, in 90 when I was still, still a student. But Spiti Valley was open the same year. And I had the small travel account, also a French one, where they told about Tabo being a three-dimensional mandala, and I thought, I'm hooked. And so I took the chance to go to Shimla because I wanted to see Kinder too, and then went there, and luckily I met Mohit, who made, paved the way to all these Himalayan wonders. <laughs> that way, this is the story. Thank you. Fascinating story. Tara, I think, wanted to ask yeah. something too, right? Yeah. We actually have Preeti Tyagi also who's raised her hand and okay, Tara. Sorry. So uh, we'll take Preeti and then we'll take Tara. Hey guys, hey guys. Firstly, it's Preet, not Preeti. Common mistake. Sorry for my haggard look. I'm cooking while... Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm very used to it. Don't worry about it. I'm very, very used to it. Anyway, sorry for the haggard look. I'm actually making dinner while going through the entire lecture right now. but. Uh, 
very quickly yeah you firstly thank you so much for this lecture and uh, sonali you had asked me why i want to be part of this and what not is this for this all of this it's about discovering the unknown so many things you don't know about i just love curiosity takes a bit of me i like knowing so many new things that's but, the other uh, and known of the past this is more about uh, you kept alluding to the fact that we need to do a or we need to do b or x and y or whatever right in different parts of the lecture so i just want to know from you what is kind of a road map for the future that you see a viable road map from your point of view and the general point of view for us to explore all of this more because a lot of what's happening in the northernmost parts reaches of a country in tibet in the entire indo tibetan region which is kind of a common heritage is unknown right we know a lot from the spiritual texts in the manner of speaking we know some from the artistic manner of speaking of what you are saying but there is no actual written history documented to that accuracy that can actually tell us what transpired there over a thousand over thousands of years right so mm. for that we need a lot of research to happen in that area and according to you what is the best road map for that well i think it depends um, if you really talk about a road map meets like an itinerary which would be a good place to start and which would be a place to to see is that what you what you no, mean no, no, by no, no. I'm, not, i'm not talking from a personal point of view i'm okay. just talking from a holistic educational academic point of view like well, what is really possible that is right even more of a of a um, varied question because the problem is the politics in that region you know yeah. it's very difficult it used to be well it, there's a hiatus now because it ended with the chinese invasion before it was a hiatus because you could not access tibet but when we talk historically we had the 11th century where none of this was existing like there were fiefdoms fiefdoms like small uh places where some local ruler was 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 living and of course there were invasions like the west tibetan people they the west tibetan kings didn't come there uh, without any military intervention of course but they made this as i showed in this map they made this one region and that region is culturally if it used to be culturally um one uh, thing that where you can where you can where you can actually really see um the the relationship between the various places like when okay. when i so show you charang with those um those three dimensional figures that is connected to tabo then alchi is connected to that surely mangyang or other places in tibetan uh, used to be having this kind of uh, cultural assets cultural um, expressions like that um the road map that you are referring to is very varied because you have the kailash also there the sacred mountain yeah which is sacred to hindus buddhists uh to the burn practitioners and uh, the jain people so there has been a thousand years of connection between india and tibet in that and you had a a, a yatra a route going via gawal up to the kailash which is again you have boti people on the northern part of of the gawal as well so as soon the the higher you rise into that region the more tibetan it becomes and used to be no problem at all because it's just people that can adapt to this uh, locality can live there and are able to live there you know so it used to be from thousands years before it used to be like that now with the thing becoming political that china i must admit saying that everybody who has slightly uh, almond eye shape yeah is belonging to china that makes things very very difficult we were like i remember with mohit discussing many times how wonderful it would be going from kinor following the sutlej river up to tolling because it takes only like i think 5 days on foot to travel up to tolling which was the capital that's why it was possible to become a a, a, a unified region a cultural region because the access routes were through the river valleys and small passes that they used to cross in order to you know, spread spread their uh, ideas and all that but that is closed now there is a trade route going up via that pass which is from nako there's a first trade link that has started so it's bits small pieces where it becomes possible i am working actually in regard of trying to open things up like we have this real funny um thing about my last books which are all available in china 
And there are two books. One has even a forward by the Dalai Lama, and the other one has a forward by the teacher of the Dalai Lama. But the Chinese don't know, at least they say, and they don't care because they sell, those books sell somehow. The only thing you cannot put into a book is a, is a photograph of His Holiness because it will be skimmed through by the authorities. And if they see something that they know which is, not, which is intolerable, then they say, no, this will not be sold here. So I have no problem with my books being sold in, in China, not because of financial things, but because this is a way also to bridge a gap because there are so, so many Buddhists in China, so many people that yearn for information, that start to be a bit apprehensive about what is told, what people are telling them regarding the Tibet question. You know, was it really, are the Tibetans really that bad? Are they really only half human or whatever the Chinese government is telling the other Chinese people? Really, really badly, I must really say. And, and, and so from the Buddhist point of view, this is another way of opening up that region. Uh, um, I think other things like, um, from a cultural point of view, right now are still impossible. Like if you would talk to the authorities to get together from an archeological point of view and make a meeting in India or in China where all these things are put together and discussed, I don't think this will work because right now the Chinese government is pretending to preserve Chinese cultural heritage by doing their conservation and preservation work in Tibet. That is really the, the bad thing about it. I mean, they do a lot and they do good work. They do these three-dimensional uh, photography because they have all the time in the world, but they say it because Tibet has always been an integral part of China. And that of course is not the case, you know, even after international law. So, and with these, these border issues now taking place, I think it's a quite sensitive time right now. But on the other hand, we should not bring this up too much because I think it only happens because China is facing so much trouble with the coronavirus situation. That's why as the Russians were doing it, as Americans, Jenny are doing it, they're always you know, fighting against the outside if they have too many inter internal problems. So right now, I think the way to go is working on a small scale, being happy that trade things take place, that their interactions are taking place. And the rest, I think, is a lot of library research because there are books about it. It starts with the British, unfortunately. You know, the, um, uh, the, the, it started with trade route research. The British were very strict and very good on doing their research, then cultural heritage with Franke. And we can only take it one step at a time. I think this Google book that I did was the first time that a book came out that had uh, cultural places on the Chinese side as well as on the Indian side. Unfortunately, this is sold out now. And as I told you, it was you know, very high price on the internet if you can get it at all. But we're planning on doing a three-part series in a folder of those three books, Tabo, Google, and Alchi together. So we'll have a full uh, view on West Tibetan art, at least. And I, I was always very interested to write long chapters on the history of these places. So the history naturally combines Indian side and Chinese side too. So maybe this is one contribution one can do to the roadmap that you are outlining. Yeah, yeah, I and mean, that answers quite a lot. Again, as you said, very varied and uh, yeah, I mean, that, that pretty much puts it there, right? We need the access to increase for the interactions to increase, for the access to increase, because only then will we be able to really reach that. Not everyone's a brave heart like you going there back in 1990, whatever you went there. Right, so right. yeah, for us to really make our students go there and start doing more research, we need that access. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Lodita. Yeah, this, this has well, been very Just. Thank you, Preet. And now I'm correct with your name. So uh, we have uh, Tara. Tara, you can ask your question. Okay. Um, to start with, if I might mention something before I come to my question. Uh, at the museum here in Singapore, currently, we have a, a painting mandala, Vajradhatu mandala from central Tibet, which mm -hmm. is supposed to be attributed to the 11th century. It's okay. on a long, long loan to the Singapore Museum. 
Is that really online? Is it possible to see it somewhere on a website uh, or so? I can, once I have your email, I can actually send you a picture. Oh, great. That would be wonderful, yeah. A lady called Jane Casey Singer. I don't know if you know about her. Of course, yeah. She's a great scholar. Paintings of Central Tibet, and she has one or two pages on this. But yeah. I can't remember the name of her article. But I, I can, you know, I just have the picture I took. And great, I can, yeah, please. Do so. It's the same time period that's why I okay it. great yeah uh, i've been if i can add to that there have been two timelines of course or two uh, um, uh, geographical lines it didn't yeah. stop in central tibet like when when uh, the burn religion was taking over again and the kings were expelled from eastern tibet there was a movement and also the nepali nevaris were invited again to create the central tibetan style but the real true conversion and the whole uh, getting this thing back again came from the Western Tibetan side. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so my questions are actually around two other things. One was the wooden figures you showed. I'm actually a Kashmiri from Kashmir. So mm -hmm. I was raised in Delhi, but we are kind of Kashmiri speaking Kashmiris. And uh, so I was very interested in that because when it comes to Kashmir school of art, very difficult to find there are a few ivories, the Bagram ivories and a few other things, but the wooden figures are all gone mm -hmm. because they deteriorated. So this was wonderful to see. And I could yeah. see from the iconography, they look very Kashmiri to me yeah. too. So I would, name what I would I, do is I would send you the PDF, PDF of the book, of that part of the book where I write on it and we can see the photographs of them because it's, they're actually not purely uh, Kashmiri. It's already a mixture between that the Kashmiris have informed the, uh, the, the West Tibetan craftsmen to work on that because there are comparison between Kashmiri figures where certain iconographic things are different from Kashmiri ones, but it's very close still. Right, right, right. I mean, there's very, there's hardly anything left of the new right. art before yeah. the 10th century. There are the sculptures mostly in Western museums. Yeah. The That's why this Charang place was so important. I mean, this, uh, yeah. the mandala on the wall, like in Tabu, but on a horizontal scale. So one part of the directional Buddhas on that wall, the other one there, the other one there, not like in Tabu as a round, but those figures on the altar were just amazing. Yeah, yeah. Well, there is, um, I don't know if you know of the Gilgit manuscript, the very yeah. old Gilgit manuscript. Mm -hmm. had a book cover and that's actually in the Kashmir in the Srinagar Museum. I don't know okay. what it's like now. And that has painted figures of Buddhas and okay. yeah. the piece left, which is oh, supposed to yeah. be It'd be great to see also, yeah. I think that that's that, there's an article on that or more articles on that too, yeah. One of our books, The Arts of Kashmir, I think has a one or two reproductions. So I can send those to you. Okay, great. That would be wonderful. And I actually wrote a, published a, an article on the Gilgit Manuscript. So I'll send that. Okay, great. Uh, but my main question was, uh, I was just interested, if you came across the people worshipping Tara, were they always Buddhist or were they also Hindus? And I asked this because I was actually raised a Kashmiri I was raised in a Kashmiri Hindu Brahmin household. So we are not Buddhist by, you know, by my upbringing. And I was named after my own grandmother who had passed away before I was born and her name was Sara. So mm -hmm. it would not have been named after the Buddhist Sara, okay. but obviously after a Hindu Sara. But I don't know anything about practices to a Hindu Sara. And I was told in Kashmir, people did not differentiate much at all. Buddhists and Hindus were both worshipping Tara. So, well, that's a great question. First of all, I could send you a bibliography on, uh, I think, a book on Indian goddesses by a, by, a, by, a, by a woman, a scholar, who has written, who has put that all together. Because she states that, and that is the case, I mean, all what we find in Tibetan Buddhism or in Buddhism, uh, you know, once it expanded beyond the Hinayana Buddhism, the Mahayana, when it started, it incorporated all of these different traditions. And I think, for example, 
one of the person that was very important for the Tara cult was Atisha. Atisha. Yeah. And he stayed for very long in Nepal. And Nepal as a place where Hinduism and Buddhism is, you know, practice on the same scale. Naturally, he, you know, got things together. And your question in that regard touches a core point in the Alchi book. Yeah. Is, is everything okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Because the iconography of that green Tara on the cover or the main image that everybody's familiar with does not have any iconographic uh, resemblances any, anywhere in the world. There are no six-armed Taras. But when you start looking at Hindu iconography, you find that there's a, a goddess of fertility, which is called Vasudhara. Yes. And Vasudhara is holding a rice ear in her hand. And the Tara, in, in the, 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 the goddess that has been labeled as Tara uh, in, ta in Alchi, uh, that famous one, is also holding that. And she has a very interesting mudra that is not there on any other Taras. So I allowed myself to question that this is really a Tara. And I said, it has more features of a Vasudhara, which mm -hmm. is again a deity which wow. is absolutely worshipped in Nepal. And Atisha, who came to Western Tibet in the 11th century, even met Vincent Zanpo. Right. Um, he, he was a person who, who, who was very, very um, important for the Tara cult in Tibet. So naturally, all these different influences from Hindu goddesses and Buddhist deities, they all were mixed together. And the great thing about those monasteries in Western Tibet, the, the Guga monasteries, Vincent Zanko monasteries, they're all before the iconographic fixation. They're yeah. all before that. So what you see there is deities that are not present anywhere else. So iconography is different. Also the idea behind the goddess is different. So it's very difficult to say this is a Tara or this is an Avalokiteshvara or if it's an Avalokiteshvara, it might mean something completely different in that background because none of this stuff had been fixed. It, all the iconography was only fixed in the 14th century with the Dalai Lamas coming in and all that. So the central Tibetan style and everything was 17th century um, was, was fixed and the iconography was like that until now. But at that time, it was not at all. So I think, you know, the people that I, I experienced in Alchi during my work or while I was waiting for the permit, there are a lot of um, Indian tourists coming up there. They have no problem praying to whoever is inside the temple, of course, also to the, the female, uh, to the goddesses. Um, of course, I did not ask anybody, do you think this is a Tara? But from my own iconographic research, I was seriously doubting that this is a, a Tara in the pure or true sense of the word as we know her now. That's why I always say Vasudhara Tara because it's so many, so many influences that have, you know, come together there. And uh, like the same thing is with Prajnaparamita. There's a Prajnaparamita oh, yeah. there, which has, uh, again, six arms. Many of these have six arms there, but it has another color. So when you look at the sadhanas, or the, read all the texts about it, there again, there's so much um, unclarity. None, none of all the stuff is completely fixed. Like sometimes they say uh, in a sadhana or in, in an instruction in, in work, uh, Tara comes from the so-and-so from the east or from wherever, and she has this in her hand, but she doesn't, they don't mention the, 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 the number of the arms and all that. So naturally some artist gets the idea, okay, I can paint Tara, it fits better with six arms. Although, or, or even we don't know the, the, um, the root text about that because lots of these things have been lost. Many of these things did not fit into the iconography that was fixed later on. So might have been discarded from the Kanjur and the Tanjur. And that's why I'm saying it would be important to finally have access to the Chinese sources because we know that in China, a lot of translation work was going on also during that time and it must have been the same text. So maybe something is, has been preserved there which is gone in any other place like that. Thank Doesn't you. Doesn't answer your question. <laughs> Peter and Tara, 
I would like to add uh, something. So right in the Kulu Valley, we have a goddess here, uh, a local goddess who's called Ugratara, the fierce form of Tara. And it so happens she's also called Bhutanti because she originally comes from Bhutan. And uh, if you know the Palas, they came uh, to the Himalayas and they got their goddesses with them. They would carry the main, kul, you know, the uh, goddess of the the kings and Tara was one of them and here she became Ugratara and she's such a Hinduized goddess here and she's so fierce that you can't actually enter the temple uh, or only the shaman and the priest and the association of the shaman is also very interesting and it's a wooden temple it's not a stone temple so it's very interesting to see these local deities here uh, Tripura Sundri and Tara and Hidimba they are uh, very Buddhist so um, there's a Tara here as well. Well, not only are they Buddhists, I think they are the local gods that would actually later on imply Buddhism and Hinduism because those were the strong religions. And as far as I understand it, that's why I love this research there so much with all the sociological aspects coming in. Many of the people took on to Buddhism or Hinduism because they had better trade relations then. Mm -hmm. So... The great thing about, about Kulu Valley and Kinar and this, these trans, trans, uh, trans, how do you call it? The sections between, it does, yeah, <laughs> where, where it's in between lowlands and highlands is that you have local people that have local cults. Like nowhere in the world are these moras, you know, that you have everywhere in Kulu and in Kinar and all this. This is like a very special thing that you have in that part of the region. And, when you, then they come together and Hadimba festival, as I understand it, was all the deities from the valleys, from the rivers, from the wind, from the, from the, from the waters, they all come together. And now in the end, they say the preside, the gods preside, the God presiding over them is Shiva. But it wasn't that way before, you know. So later things, I think that was implied onto a local cult. Like in Charang, for example, I would probably remember that if he's still there. Um, there was a local deity in, in the, uh, put into the wall there, and we were not, we, after hours of discussion, if we can photograph that mandala on the wall, we were not supposed to photograph this small idol, which is like that, is a, a riding um, protective deity that is just for Charan, but it had features of a lot of Buddhist um, uh, deities, but they would not, never call it Buddhist. They would call it local spirit that they worship there. And so I think there's even more that, that Buddhism and Hinduism came later onto these local cults, as we have it here in Christianity in, in the West too. You know, the, the churches were built on the old cult places where the big trees were standing, they were cut down and then they put the trees up there. And so it's the same everywhere with those uh, religions that missionize or that, that uh, you know, are just stronger than the other ones. You know, that's true with the local de deities. They call the, uh, the uh, you have the Garna Devtas and the Van Devtas. The Garna is like, uh, they're more popular. And then the Van Devtas are, you know, in the villages and then they come and they join uh, with the main deity right. over time. So yeah. very pre-Buddhist, pre-Hindu kind of cults that mingled with the other ones to make Which these. I think it's very interesting. I mean, we know a lot about Hinduism. We know a lot about Buddhism, but to have something unique somewhere, I think that's, that drew me to Kinar and, and Kulu all the time because I thought, wow, these, these and, and there's so much, mi much mixture, mixture. You have the yak tails on top of the ratas. Then you have those golden and silver masks. And below you have a Hindu thing, which is a rata, but then it starts shaking and the shaman or the priest falls into trance. All these, Ladakh has that too. And the, the, what I was discussing before, those Buchan Lamas that, that bring something very archaic with their, their piercing things there and showing to uh, the spirit that they are strong and all that. Those, I think, are very, very interesting cultural assets to, just to um, research on. And also the photograph that we're showing with the piercing of, you know, the thing going here. Uh, just recently, last month, there's a temple here of, of a local deity where the shaman does the same thing with the swords. So there is some kind of commonality in the Western Himalayas of yeah. these traditions, which are very shamanistic, very yeah. pre-Hindu, pre-Buddhist. And there is a common uh, thing going on. 
I have another, uh, some small funny thing to add there. When we, <laughs> Moet was there too, we were filming that ritual in Pin Valley. And the, the, the one guy was like the master, master uh, performer or master priest. And his, the other guy was his son and he was not as good as yet <laughs> in these performances. And when he started piercing his cheek, it was bleeding like hell. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas the other guy was just, you know, piercing it, no blood, because he had pierced it so often that the blood probably decided, no, I go another way for doing my thing. But I'm not going to go there because I'm going to gush out there anyhow. And this poor guy, the small fellow, was piercing it. All the blood came out. He said, okay, he still has to learn. <laughs> I, was, I was interviewing the shaman and I said, uh, do you actually, uh, what is that word? What is that word when you, uh, I said, do you disinfect the needle? Uh, that was my first question. And he said, I don't know. I was like, oh, I should observe I that. Know I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it cannot infect him. It's a holy thing. So he, he yeah. has to stay healthy. <laughs> but that was, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lay common person who would think about getting disinfected, you know, oh, not no, having no. a needle. So anyway, I was you just... probably know how much it hurts and how bad it is if it's dirty. So that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're already California, Californiaized, or how you call that? <laughs> you're not, you're not Indian anymore. No, no, I'm very Indian. I'm very Kulu. I, I would say I, I feel I belong to Kulu. <laughs> I think so too. Yeah. Any other questions? This has been so interesting, Peter. Do you know this has gone on for three hours, just like a Bollywood I know. film? I know. Yeah. And we still have 19 people with us, 18. Yeah, so, yeah. Popping out now like flies. Yeah. <laughs> and it's uh, almost <gasps> 11. And uh, yeah. if we do not have any questions, this has been so incredible. I think this has been, this has been our longest talk. And I'm so happy <laughs> that uh, uh, we could have it going smoothly without any uh, internet issues uh, in Frankfurt or in India. Frankfurt. Yeah, I and hope I'm not traveling too long. If I were, you probably would have left anyhow. I, I wouldn't have. And uh, Preet is saying we, we can go on talking and listening, but it's late. Okay. That's and right. yeah. So thank you, Preet, for listening. Thank you all for who are here. And Peter, do share your email so I can post it on the group. Yeah. And uh, I would love to get your uh, video on um, through Dropbox so we can post it. And if you could also send a list of your books for those of... Uh, 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 those uh, of you who want to get those books, you can know the titles and uh, now you have a map so you can, you, you'll know what to pick and choose. So thank you yes, so wonderful. much, Peter, for being Thank here. you for having me. That's always, a, it's, it's not my second life. I would probably many times say it's my first life because I don't invest much more in anything else than into this because I love it so much. And it's, it's given me back so much. And it's like COVID for me is the most terrible thing because I cannot travel to India or up to Tibet or Himalayas or wherever. So that's the problem. And COVID but, for me is I'm stuck. I'm so happy. I'm, I'm wonderfully yeah. stuck in the Himalayas. Good. So lucky you. <laughs> lucky me. So maybe good karma, right? Good karma. That's right. That's right. Me, bad <laughs> karma. So, <laughs> have to work more. Yeah. So, on Sunday, let's meet again at 4 p.m., okay. all of you. And have a wonderful week ahead. And, Peter, thanks so much again. And all of you for your wonderful questions and your patience. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. And uh, we'll wait for the Himalayas to open. So, all of you can just come and, uh, you know. Okay. Get to all those. Thanks a lot for having me. Uh, yeah. Sarah, we'll be in touch about all these things. And we'll be in touch with anybody else. Thank Great. you, buddy. Bye, okay. and I'll post the videos. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.